Good morning and welcome to this Environment and Economy Scrutiny Committee meeting. Um, I am Councillor Ian Carrington and I am Chairman for the Committee. Uh, Councillor Martin Griggs, Vice Chairman of the Committee, is also present. Um, a few housekeeping notes. Firstly, can I remind you that this uh, formal public meeting is being broadcast live via the County Council's website. Um, health and safety. We can't go on without a health and safety announcement. There is no fire alarm practice planned for this morning. Um, <clears throat> in the event of the fire alarm sounding, we must leave the building through the rear doors, the ones at that end of the building, and assemble in the front car park and wait there for further instructions. Um, the room is full of devices. Could you please all make sure, as I had failed to do, that your mobile laptop and iPad are now on silent. The hearing loop is activated. If anybody needs assistance with that, I'm seeing no one in the room. Um, requests to speak will be collated by the Vice Chairman. Should you wish to speak, please raise your hand for any members or supporting officers who have joined us via Teams. Request to contribute uh, will be collated by the Scrutiny Officer, Cara Hagianu. We will now move on to the formal agenda, beginning with apologies for absence and replacement members. Thomas. Thank you, Chairman. We have Councillor Parker sitting for Councillor Killey for this meeting only, and that is uh, all the apologies and substitutions. Thank you very much indeed, and I believe, um, due to an element of double booking, uh, Councillor Linda Wooten may be joining us slightly later than planned. Um, second item on the agenda, declaration of members' interest. Does any member have an interest to declare? I'm seeing no hands raised. As usual, if uh, something does occur to you as the meeting progresses, please raise, that, <coughs> raise it at the time. Moving on. Item three, minutes of the meeting on the 13th of September, which, were which was reconvened and held on the 25th of October. As members would remember, at the previous meeting, we considered the agenda of the adjourned meeting on the 13th of September. Therefore, uh, we have to consider and vote today on approving two sets of meeting minutes, one being the agenda of the reconvened meeting, which you'll remember was very brief, and the other, the agenda of the 25th of October meeting. So, the minutes of the September meeting can be found on pages five to eight of the agenda pack. Do I have a proposer for those minutes? Uh, thank you very much. Councillor Taylor, do I have a seconder? Councillor Fleetwood? Um, I'm seeing nobody raising any comments. Ah, Councillor Spratt. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Can I just confirm, in fact, that for both meetings, I did send my apologies in uh, and uh, Councillor Marfleet did sub for me. Uh, the fact that he subbed for me is in the minutes but not the fact that I put my apologies in so for the record if that could be uh, just added I'd be very grateful. I'm sure we can make sure that that is proper. Thank you Chairman that goes <coughs> for both combined meetings. Indeed. Thank you. <coughs> uh, subject to those changes then it's been proposed and seconded we're dealing still with the 13th September agenda. Uh, all those in favour, please raise your hand. Any against? Any abstentions? So that is carried. That is carried. And moving on now to the second meeting. Again, may I have a proposer? Councillor Taylor. And seconded again, Councillor Fleetwood. Councillor Baxter. Sorry, I, I had comments on the second meeting, but not the first. That's fine. If you'd like to make a comment, please yes. go ahead. Um, that is, uh, first of all, um, the auto-correct um, has, has failed us again, uh, and the mention of Anglican water did, did make me laugh. Um, I don't know if that's for back we better not comment on that. <laughs> um, but the second thing is, under item 10, uh, Federal Thorpe Gas Terminal, um, I raised this issue and asked when it would be discussed, and I'm sure that you said that it would be discussed early in the new year. I think you may have even said it at our January, January meeting. Uh, I think I said earlier in the new year, but yes, I, I, that, 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 that is certainly our hope. Yeah, that's not recorded in the minutes. It's on the work programme. Uh, it's, I'm informed, on the work programme. Okay, as, as long as it's still there. I'm no, no, we won't, we won't, believe me, we certainly won't be forgetting that. <laughs> thank uh, you. But it is in the work programme, so it is properly recorded, but in another place. So, uh, thank you for that comment. I'm not seeing any further comments, so may we move to a vote. It's been proposed, it's been seconded. All those in favour, please show. Any abstentions? 
Any against? Thank you very much. That is carried. That is carried. So we now move to item five, chairman's announcements. I don't have any major announcements this morning, but I do just want to update colleagues on an item which was discussed at our last meeting, uh, namely issues of parking and tourism in the coastal area. Uh, there will be a work group. Um, officers and myself have discussed that in some detail and a great deal of progress has been made. We'll report in more detail to uh, the committee at its next meeting. Um, the work group will be a work group. We're not going to be reinventing the wheel. There were two very important strands raised at that meeting. We will pursue both. It will be an action-oriented group. We'll talk a little bit uh, about that at our next meeting, but I did want to uh, just reassure members that progress is being made on that, and that will go into the work program in due course. Other than that, I have no chairman's comments to make, so we move to executive councillor Announcements. Um, are there any announcements from executive councillors um, or indeed uh, support members who are acting for them? Councillor Dyer. Thank you, Chairman. I'll keep my comments brief, especially um, when, you can, when you look at the room and there's more officers than councillors, you know it's going to be a heavy agenda. Um, and I will start with my apologies. I have to leave shortly to attend the opening of the University of Lincoln's Ross Lucas Medical Science Building for 11 o'clock. Um, the South Lincolnshire Food Enterprise Zone at Hull Beach in South Holland continues to progress. Phase one, um, the, the council's first innovation centre, the Hub Building, opened in September, and the first two business tenants have recently moved in, taking a total of five officers at the, in the building. Um, interest in the 27-acre phase two also continues, including advanced discussions with a Buckinghamshire-based business interest in one acre and early discussions with another business interested in five acres. At Curtin Distribution Park in Boston Borough, two separate developers with significant job creation plans continue to undertake their due diligence with a view to completing the purchase of phases two and three. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, Chairman, um, I joined a tour of potential economic development um, regeneration schemes with you as the committee's chairman, Councillor Boutroyd, the executive member for property, and the economic infrastructure management team, some of which are in the room, Mick, Ian and Simon. We viewed the potential Boston Road industrial estate expansion in Horncastle, um, which is due to be presented to this committee in the near future. And that current estate is at capacity and there is a demonstrable local demand for um, a further nine acres. You'll also remember on that rainy day, Chairman, we also viewed the site at the potential Spitalgate Business Park in Grantham, the development site of over 19 acres, which has been made possible as a direct benefit of the new Grantham Southern Relief Road. And we also visited several other schemes um, which are currently at the initial exploration stage. And it's... Um, Hope you'll agree, Chairman, that was a useful and productive morning um, and early afternoon for us, for us to do. We also continue to help business productivity. We now have formal confirmation in the autumn budget that the National Made Smarter programme has been extended due to our successful bid for the East Midlands. And this will help uh, our small, medium-sized businesses firms boost their productivity through advanced digital technology. And finally, Chairman, our successful bid for the regional development, the, the region, I'll get there, the, one minute, let me make this bigger. Our successful bid for the region to the, develop, the Department for Culture, Media and Sports Create Growth Programme will see £1.275 million in grant funding coming to this area. And you'll be aware we have some fantastic businesses in the creative sector in the county, but many don't have the support they need to scale up and attract investment for growth. This funding means they can, they can get specialist support to overcome those challenges, and businesses will be supported to reach investors through pitching events, and will be able to draw from a fund of up to £7 million being managed by Innovate UK to support them in achieving their growth potential. That's it from me on behalf of Councillor Davy, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Dyer, and uh, yes, I would absolutely endorse uh, your comments about the value of that trip we made around economic development sites 
uh, and I would uh, thank the team for their work and indeed for taking us around on what was, as you say, a torrentially wet day. It just underlined as we went around the really important role that local government can play, whether it's at county level or district stroke city stroke borough level, in working with the private sector to encourage economic development. It is a crucial role. It is one that we take very seriously in this county uh, at all levels, and it is uh, uh, it was a very, very valuable trip uh, in underlining some great projects that are emerging. So I don't think we have any uh, input from Councillor McNally this morning. In that case, I will move on to senior officers. Are there any officer announcements from lead officers? I'm seeing a general shaking of heads, so we'll take that as a no. Thank you very much. We will move on to item six on the agenda, which is Inward Investment Strategic Plan for Team Lincolnshire. This report is on pages 17 to 28 of the agenda pack. The report enables the committee to review and comment on the achievements of the initial 2020 to 2022 Inward Investment Strategic Plan and investment objectives set out in the new two-year 23 to 25 Strategic Plan for Team Lincolnshire. And the actions before us this morning are that the committee is invited to one, Review and comment on the achievement of the initial 2020 to 2022 Inward Investment Strategic Plan and two, to consider and endorse the proposed investment objectives set out in the new two-year 2023 to 2025 Strategic Plan for Team Lincolnshire. The report will be presented by Samantha Harrison, Head of Economic Development, and Karen Seal, Principal Place and Investment Officer, and I think Karen is with us via team. So over to you, Samantha and Karen. Morning, everybody. Um, sorry I couldn't join you in person, um, but I'm here to take you through um, a review of last year and our new two year business plan. Uh, hopefully, you can all see me okay. Um, we've had a tremendous first two years of our two year business plan for 2020 2022. We grew from 109 Team Lincolnshire members um, through to um, 147 which is a ph phenomenal and we're still growing and their businesses of all sizes across a variety of sectors um, going all across Greater Lincolnshire. We, um, some of the other successes we've had, we've dealt with 102 inward investment inquiries have been serviced by Team Lincolnshire, um, seen some really great successes in Global Berry, a uh, soft fruit um, producer landing in Nocton, creating 300 jobs. And we've had other companies such as City Fibre, who are an independent broadband company. We help support land them in the region. We've also done a lot around uh, attracting investment and promoting the South Lincolnshire Food Enterprise Zone and the new hub building on there. We launched a webinar um, during COVID um, where 500 people were in attendance and we've really helped support the regeneration team in um, attracting um, potential investors for that site and that's ongoing. Team Lincolnshire itself have helped create 331 jobs uh, throughout those businesses and the growth that they've seen. We've developed sector propositions. They have been particularly um, fantastic in helping us attract new inward investment. Uh, we now have those in agri-food, low carbon, um, logistics, advanced engineering and manufacturing, defence and security, and we have other ones in development uh, soon to be launched, such as Visitor Economy, and they really have been instrumental to um, Team Lincolnshire attracting new investment to the region. We launched a new website in October 21, which again supports the place promotion, helps support the Team Lincolnshire ambassadors, but again helps to, to attract investment uh, for us here. We've done lots of other events as well, um, supported uh, ambassadors through COVID via coffee clubs and webinars and also physical events. So hopefully you can you can see that we've had a really successful two years and we're drawing on that now for the new two year business plan, which will cover 2023 to 2025. Um, in the papers, you will see that you've got the detail of the overarching objectives. So we're going to be concentrating on putting place at the heart of everything that we do and around the promotion to ensure that we are really promoting Greater Lincolnshire as a place not just to invest and work, but to visit and learning. 
Um, we are continuing the success uh, and the growth of our agri-food sector by really promoting the UK Food Valley offer. We are championing and um, helping promote the Humber Freeport offer um, to potential investors in the supply chain that's around that and also tying in the whole decarbonisation and sustainability agenda. And then for this year, we're also going to be concentrating on the defence and security cluster, uh, which Team Lincolnshire have already started to support in helping launch the Greater Lincolnshire Defence and Security Network a couple of months ago. So through all of that, we also have some key themes that we'll make sure is woven through them. So they're around sustainability, skills, health and well-being and digitalisation. And we'll also have some other propositions come out around digitalisation as well. So I just wanted to really point out a couple of the overarching ob objectives in the plan and um, just talk you through them in a little bit more detail. But hopefully you've, you've gone through them in the pack that was given. So for the uh, food sector one in particular, we're going to be, like I said, focusing on UK food value and really um, trying to promote the investment opportunities around the seafood sector, particularly around ag aquaculture and the benefits, uh, the health benefits of, of fish. Um, we are going to try and really tie in with um, digital technology and automation uh, and helping us with the skills agenda then to support that sector. Um, and the low carbon element of the food chains really help and support those logistics companies um, that are obviously instrumental uh, for the food sector. So there'll be a lot of underlying work that takes place to deliver these overarching five objectives. So to conclude, I just really like the members to note the achievements of the initial two year in inward investment strategic plan and kind of see the momentum that's been growing. Um, we've got these focus sector propositions that's really, really helping us drive investment. And I really want you to endorse the proposed new two year business plan. So I welcome any comments. Thank you very much indeed, Karen. Before we turn to Member Samantha, do you have anything to add to that? Or? The only comment was just to say um, it's really pleasing to see the public and private sector partnership with the Team Lincolnshire members and those that group acting as ambassadors on our behalf to promote Lincolnshire. So I uh, just wanted to raise that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that. So, members, um, before I turn to members <clears throat> and invite them to speak, I've been passed a note saying there are two acronyms in the report which are not explained. One is MIPIM which is a French acronym standing for the International Market for Real Estate Professionals, and the other is UKREIIF, which stands for real UK's Real Estate Investment and Infrastructure Forum. And I know members are very keen about clarity in reports, so I thought I would share that information before we turn. So, uh, members, do we have anybody asking to speak? Yeah. Councillor Bowles. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> yeah, I've got a question on page 21, which is the business plan strategic objectives. Um, the circle on the left-hand side says to cap capitalise on East Midlands Airport and Humber Free Freeport. Um, it's disappointing, given that Doncaster Airport is 20 minutes from my division, that Doncaster Airport is no longer on there. Um, it's been well represented to me from businesses in my area, Gainsborough and the surrounding areas, that the impact of the closure of Doncaster Airport has had on them in terms of you know, trade, investment and supply chains. Um, so I guess my question is, um, do we believe that that closure of that airport is going to um, impact on some of this work that's been achieved so far? Um, and another question is, what is LCC still doing to try and... Um, see the uh, potential takeover of Doncaster Airport go through and that airport reopen uh, for the wider benefits of that area. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Who would like to pick that one up, Karen or Samantha? Karen? Well, I'll, I'll leave Samantha to answer the latter part of that. Um, but I think that obviously it's a real shame about Doncaster Airport. Um, but I think uh, what we're doing with Team Lincolnshire, it's not actually all about um, 
uh, businesses that are located here. It's businesses that are located out of the area as well. And it's about how we can support them and help them uh, grow Greater Lincolnshire. We have many members that want to know what's happening here. So I think it will it potentially can help the supply chain businesses around Doncaster Airport. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add to that, Samantha. So I think for us, in terms of um, the working with Doncaster Airport and the gap, we have got our international trade strategy. So we will be working with all of our businesses to see how their supply routes come into Lincolnshire and support them moving forward. So we will be lobbying on their behalf and trying to get everything rerouted. Um, I can answer the second question if that's okay. So in terms of the airport, we are working closely with West Lindsay District Council uh, and we're looking at part of a, a regional programme to see if there are there is a viability for the airport to reopen. So that is ongoing. Thank you. Councillor Bowles, does that answer your question? Thank you very much indeed. And I think next was Councillor Parker. Councillor Parker. Thank you. <clears throat> There's a lot of good stuff in this report, um, particularly the 2022 plan, which seems to have been um, delivered very, very well indeed. Uh, and the next year, 23 to 25 also looks as though it's got great potential. My question relates to um, locating Lincolnshire within a national context in relation to inward investment. Because whilst we can look at this paper uh, and, and think good things about it, it's all relative to how well other local authorities of a similar um, makeup to Lincolnshire, um, essentially rural, partly coastal, um, small villages um, and n n no what we might call major dominant um, centre of population. So uh, my question really relates to, yes, this is good, but can we have it put into a context that maybe talks about how well Norfolk have done, Suffolk have done, um, Cornwall and Devon have done, relatively speaking? Um, then we could actually know whether our performance um, is not only good internally, but it's good on the, on, uh, in relation to um, other um, <coughs> local authorities, uh, uh, so that we take into the, uh, take into account the national context. Thank you. Interesting question. Who'd like to pick that one up? Karen, Samantha. Uh, um, excuse me. I can pick that up. In terms, of what we can do is work with our colleagues. We have got contacts. Um, across the inward investment piece, so we can do a benchmarking exercise and feed back to the group. And I think the only thing I'd just like to add to that, there was a recent report um, launched by EY and it gave um, Lincolnshire as in the top 10 um, counties for attracting, well, I think we were placed six, uh, for attracting um, FDI investment, which is really great against some, you know, really other top counties. So it shows you that we are we are delivering on investment and our messages of promotion um, are getting out there and we are seeing then businesses land here. Councillor Parker, does that uh, deal with your question? Or you have yeah, I mean, top 10 is great, but if the total number of counties is 10, then it's, um, it, it doesn't mean anything. So perhaps I can think of 20 or 30 councils. So yes, that would put us in somewhere around about the top third. But I would, interested, I would be interested in knowing, and other people may well join me in welcoming it, um, how well are we doing in a national context? Thank you. It's an interesting point, and I'm seeing nods from our officers, and I'm sure when they come back on this topic, they will bear that in mind. I'm going to come to you next, Councillor Baxter, but I've got a question myself which actually grows out of what Councillor Parker raised. So if you forgive me, I'll, I'll, I'll just pick up on, on that point. Um, and it really grows out of... Um, part of the report, which is on page 18, uh, talking about in, in inward investment and this, this idea that uh, Councillor Parker raised of almost benchmarking. Um, if we look at that section of the report, um, w which uh, discusses inward investment over two years and quotes facilitated and influenced investment opportunities, of the 102 inquiries that the report talks about, are there any more which are in train or any that were dropped at the inquiry level and working through these, have we learned any lessons about what barriers were identified perhaps for a greater volume to be realised, what mitigations might be uh, uh, recommended to increase the volume of successful investments and 
uh, going back to, to, to Rob's point, do we know if we have lost out to any other county competing for the same investment opportunities? That's a great question. <laughs> so um, the team, um, we deal with inward investment at inquiries that come through from different sources. So we have some that come through from the Department of International Trade. Those inquiries can go to many different regions. So um, the IT will pick out which um, greater, which, sorry, which left regions um, they would like to send them to, which they think would have the best fit for the inquiry. And then we have a chance to put forward a proposition and send it back. Now, as you've just said, Councillor Carrington, you know, some of them we, we never hear back from again because other regions have been successful and, and ours just didn't meet the investors' requirements. But we are seeing more now where we are gaining traction and we are getting the visits from investors. And we're also seeing this turn in inquiries that aren't just coming through from the Department of International Trade. So they're not just foreign um, inquiries coming direct through that route. It's end users and developers, investors coming direct to us. And they're the ones that we can get real good traction with straight away because we can start to build that relationship with them and we are seeing now we i mean over the last um couple of months we've hosted quite a few investor visits and now we're at those stages of having more detailed um conversations with them um to put the nuts and bolts together on the investment opportunity so yes there are all the, always those ones that we have come through when we develop a proposition we send it back but we don't hear from but we are seeing now a greater number that we are actually um getting to the point where we can land them which is fantastic yes thank you for that um it's clearly important uh that we understand not only why we are being successful but on occasions where we are being less successful that we understand what's behind that as well in order that we can improve our own performance and i'm sure officers will uh, i hope take that on board uh, as we go forward. Uh, Councillor Baxter. Uh, th thank you, Ch Chairman. I've got three uh, different questions, but hopefully they're all relatively brief. Uh, the first one is digging into the detail on page 24 about the agri-food uh, sector. Um, when, when we read about a company like Bacavor uh, closing a plant in uh, Sutton Bridge, the salad plant, affecting 900, 900 employees potentially, how does how does it affect the county council or possibly how does the county council affect the decision or the plant? So we've, we've got an agri-food sector operation which is obviously um, un under threat of closure. How, what do we do for the company, for the site and for the employees? How, how, how are we involved? Secondly, um, on the, uh, the green agenda, um, where does it where does the county's opinion on solar farms fit with this agenda? I've got lots of people in my division who are worried about uh, solar farms, other people that, that think that solar farms are, are the best thing since sliced bread. Does the county have an opinion on solar farms? And if so, where and by whom is it expressed? Will it ever come to this committee? Uh, thirdly, um, on, the, on page 27, when we talk about defence and security, I really hope that defence and security... Uh, I'm all for defence and security of, of the UK, uh, but sometimes the defence industry is used as a euphemism for arms exports. Uh, if, if, we, if we're talking about the defence and security industry, meaning selling defence and security items to overseas, do we as a county, or does anybody else, have an agenda to look at the, the ethics of uh, arms sales? And while, while, we're, while we're talking about swords and spears, we also should be talking about um, plows and pruning hooks. Where in this whole business plan strategic objectives is the uh, agricultural machinery industry? Where, where are we encouraging people to develop um, or, or, or automatic, I want to say, ro robotic engineering. Where, where, are we, where are we encouraging Lincolnshire businesses to lead the way in terms of farm, farm technology? Thank you for those questions. Um, we'll try and unpick them. Samantha, shall I start with you? Yes, certainly. 
So in terms of the, the agri-food sector, we do work closely. We've got an agri-food advisor as part of the Business Lincolnshire Growth Hub. So we have been supporting um, Bacabor and the organisation. There are a lot of um, other um, agri-food businesses in the south of the county that are, have staff shortages. So whilst it's not ideal that Bacabor is closing um, because of the loss of a contract, they, the people have been um, able to... Um, supported to find jobs within other businesses. So um, it, it's been a, a benefit uh, moving forward. In terms of the, the green agenda, this is all, um, in terms of this business plan, it's really focusing on the decarbonisation and support of business opportunities. Um, the County Council stance hasn't, um, this is a, a part of a team Lincolnshire private public sector business plan rather than a, a direct county council office. So we are um, following county council lead, but it's really about supporting our business business community to take decarbonisation actions uh, and linking in with the decarbonisation of the Humber. Um, in terms of defence and security, the kind of businesses that we have got in um, Lincolnshire, it's more about intelligence, information, um, satellite activity rather than the kind of manufacture of arms. So it is, it's all about the knowledge, the transfer, the linkages, and the people that are coming out of the RAF bases, retaining that knowledge within Lincolnshire and, uh, and, and ensuring that they're, they're able to stay. So it's, it's a different slant um, to what you mentioned. Uh, you also mentioned about agriculture and manufacturing. So in our, in our previous um, work with Team Lincolnshire and with Business Lincolnshire, the Business Support Hub, We've got a very active agenda in terms of the agri-food sector. We support many businesses in terms of agricultural machinery production, helping them secure Innovate UK grants to develop their, their practices and processes. So we've got some great uh, successful case studies um, that we can bring forward and showcase. Councillor Baxter. Uh, thank you. So if I could come back on two of those. The, the question of solar farms i understand that it isn't this report however where do i take that question uh, councillor batster i would remind you that we have a number of applications either in lincolnshire or on the fringes of lincolnshire uh, which are our mips <coughs> nationally strategic infrastructure projects uh, on which this council will be commenting individually um, individual members have have views about whether uh, electricity is just a crop or whether food crops should take priority. I'll leave that to individual members. Strong feelings are held uh, as with your own residents. Um, but in terms of the individual applications, uh, and I know there's some very large ones which straddle uh, close to, to, to where your division is, um, those will be commented on by the planning team, um, and those comments will be made public in, in due course. Um, Councillor Baxter? Uh, thank you for that. I will, I will hunt elsewhere. Um, just coming back on the, the defence and security thing, yes, it, I understand that, that we're talking about intelligence and satellites and so on. Um, the, the question of uh, selling, selling those services to uh, foreign powers, uh, whether they're friendly foreign powers or, or difficult foreign powers, that, that question still stands, whether we're sending an actual item or whether we're se sending a service or, or intelligence. Councillor Spratt. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Just on the uh, <coughs> point that Councillor Baxter made about uh, arms supplies and such like, I have a certain sympathy with the point he made. But let's be quite clear on this. If a manufacturer came to Lincolnshire that would create hundreds of jobs in the defence procurement industry, for example, to supply air, air defence missiles to Ukraine, I don't think this council will be in a position to turn it down, Mr Chairman. Uh, I believe you're correct, Councillor Spratt. I don't think we have powers in that uh, regard. Uh, defence industries do raise moral questions, and we are very much aware of those, but I think these things have to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, this country uh, is very proud of the support that it is giving at the moment to Ukraine, for example, with a very great deal of lethal weaponry being transferred to the Ukrainians, which we could not do in the defense of Ukraine were that 
material not manufactured in Britain and if we did not have the skills to create it and make it at the same time. I'm sure as far as rebuilding Ukraine after the, the uh, Russian invasion is concerned, people like JCB, you referring to plowshares, people like JCB will be in there and we would support uh, any company in Lincolnshire who is providing the equipment to help the Ukrainians rebuild. Uh, Councillor Baxter, very briefly, because we do need to move on. Yes, we all support Ukraine. Our, is Councillor Spratt and the, the Council generally equally happy to supply arms to Saudi Arabia? I don't think we're going to formally answer that question this morning, but we know your interest in it. Councillor Dyer. Thank, thank you, Chairman, um, and, and thank you, Councillor Baxter, for your comments. Um, I, I think it's distracting from the point of the agenda and Team Lincolnshire and what Team Lincolnshire does, has been doing and will be doing in the future. Um, and I just really wanted to speak, to just to put on record, Chairman, um, Karen Seals soon to depart us um, from the County Council, and I'd just like to put on record on behalf of Colin and myself our sincere thanks and gratitude, Karen, for your work. I know Team Lincolnshire and the whole department, there's many, many people behind the scenes who work, who work within Team Lincolnshire and for Team Lincolnshire. But since my election in 2021 and becoming Colin's bag carrier, I think straight away I met with Karen and I was blown away with her positivity um, and her drive for Team Lincolnshire. And it's not just internally. Um, when I met with John from Global Berry, he had, no he had nothing but good, uh, well, he was, he was over the moon with the service that he received from the County Council and the positivity from Karen. Um, and your, your willingness, Karen, to go on LinkedIn and contact businesses and, and get them to invest in Lincolnshire. And I think when I've met and spoken with businesses, uh, they've said they've, they've never, you know, they've operated across the UK and they've never um, had the service and support from a local authority than what they've had in Lincolnshire. So, Karen, you'll certainly be missed by um, Colin and myself, but we're, we're very grateful. And I hope the committee is grateful and Lincolnshire's grateful for the work that you've done um, on, on behalf of the County Council and Team Lincolnshire. Thank you, Chairman. Well, thank you for those gracious words. Um, I wasn't aware that Karen was going to be leaving us. We were talking earlier, weren't we, about retaining skills in Lincolnshire. I'm not sure whether we're retaining her uh, in the county or, or just losing her from this council, but I'm sure the whole committee uh, would wish you uh, very well uh, going forward into the future, Karen. I'm not seeing any further uh, members wishing to speak, so I'm going to move on. We do have a proposal before us. Uh, so I move that the committee endorses the report and is satisfied with the activity and performance achieved in the past two years and that we support the proposed investment objectives for the upcoming two years. I also ask that our comments from today's discussion are taken into account in the next, next steps of the action plan as recorded. Are there any dissenting voices or hands from that? I'd like to abstain, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, abstention from Councillor Baxter, that is noted. Otherwise, no. In that case, that is agreed. Moving on, item seven is uh, service level performance and reporting against the performance framework 2022-2023 quarter two. This scrutiny report is on pages 29 to 36 of the agenda pack. This report sets out the performance of the tier two service level performance measures for 2022-2023 quarter two for the economy, flooding and waste, which are within the remit of the Environment and Economy Scrutiny Committee. Now, as you may have noticed, the layout of the report has been updated in line with the newly developed uh, Power by Dashboard. Uh, and therefore, I would appreciate your feedback on that too. The actions before us are that the committee is invited to consider and comment on the detail of the performance contained in the report and recommend any changes or actions to the relevant executive member and leading officers. And the report will be presented by Samantha Harrison, who we've heard from already, Head of Economic Development, Chris Miller, Head of Environment, and Mike Reed, Head of Waste, who are with us in the chamber. So I'd like uh, to invite officers to speak. Samantha, are you going to start us off? Yes, thank you, thank you. So I will update everybody in terms of the economy, um, corporate plan, um, objectives and targets. So in terms of the three that sit under economy, I'm delighted to say that we've either achieved or exceeded um, those three, particularly the business support measure. So this has been really enhanced from um, the support that's been given from the Business Lincolnshire Growth Hub. So we've had a number of 
support to businesses to help them scale up. We've helped manufacturing businesses in terms of looking at their supply chains, looking at their resilience. We've had a, 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 a great program, a pub diversification program, so we're trying to help our public houses to see how they can embrace new markets, embrace visitor economy and tourism support. Uh, we've had uh, Team Lincolnshire events. I'm delighted to say we've had a Getting Your Business to Net Zero. We've had a Food Revolution conference. We've been working with Marketing Humber on their food and drink campaigns. Uh, and we've also launched the Defence and Security Network. So it's been a busy time. Our colleagues in the, the um, economic infrastructure team have been supporting their businesses through their economic portfolio. So it's um, ramped up activity and I can only in, in see this increasing for the next quarter. We've got a lot of businesses that are accessing our services currently um, and they are in need of guidance and business support. Uh, in terms of our second um, target, which is number of qualifications achieved by adults, uh, I'm delighted to say this one has been exceeded uh, predominantly because we've had a high number of our qualification programs that have provided multiple qualifications to the individuals taking part. Um, that has been focused on uh, the care sector, construction, bookkeeping, payroll, hospitality, and it's level one and level two qualifications that people have achieved. Uh, we've also had our functional qualification programs, so that's the GCSEs in maths and English. Um, that we've uh, received positive results about. And I think the, the main thing to highlight here is that 65% uh, of our delivery now is back in the classroom, um, which is great. It helps with peer-to-peer -peer learning and support and guidance. Uh, but particularly to highlight, 52% are male learners, 64% are unemployed learners, so we're hoping them to employ, uh, increase their skills and confidence to enter the labour market. Um, moving forward. So the final one that I'm commenting on is external funding attracted to Lincolnshire. Uh, we've had uh, a further tranche of the European Regional Development Funds for the business support programme. So that has helped us provide business support advisors, the business support programmes I've mentioned earlier, but also advice and guidance for our websites and networks. We've had the money for the adult learning program, and we've also had money come through for the Multiply program, the new numeracy program for individuals and residents across Lincolnshire. Uh, and the final tranche has been through the Leveling Up Fund and the A16 um, funding that has come forward. So we're, we're in a, a positive position moving forward. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions on that section? Councillor Bowles. Uh, it's not a question as such, it's more of a, a request. Um, again, I think I made a similar one at last month's meeting on the other ones uh, that we looked at then. Um, I'd just like to see a bit more information. I, I know we've just been given a bit in the, um, the talk through, but for businesses supported by the council, 702, I don't know what, you know what type of businesses they were, what locations they were. You know, I'd, Personally, I'd like to see the locations to see if the support is applied across county is it folk you know is it naturally focusing in one area um, is it naturally focusing on one type of industry um, so whether it's not necessarily in these papers but if councillors could be provided with that bit more information so that we can see any trends or any anything that we need to be aware of because at the minute all we can see is 702 businesses supported and i don't really know a great deal more information thank you Thank you. Samantha, can you deal with that? And also perhaps just address whether there would be any data protection issues in, in providing that additional information. So what we would be able to do, we could, we've got a, um, a map that we can show um, where which districts have access support and the numbers. We wouldn't be able to share the business details, but we can share the, the type of sector. So we're, we, we can include that in future reports if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. That would be very helpful. Uh, Councillor Taylor, I think you're next. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Samantha, for that uh, information, that uh, report. On your earlier comments regarding support for public houses, again, some more information. This will be useful, please. As you know, they are vital to our economy and the well-being of our community, particularly in some rural uh, communities. 
So for example, do they contact you or you contact them? Or maybe some case studies of examples where they have successfully been supported or diversified in this county. It'd be interesting to hear some more, more details. And have, have we been successful in support in this particular part of the economy? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so we've got a number of uh, public houses that are working through a programme currently. We've also got a public house diversification guide that we send out. So we have been um, proactively marketing our programme across Lincolnshire to attract these pubs. But we've also got an advisor on the ground that is working um, and, and, and the visitor economy advisor that is knocking on doors to recruit them to the programme. Um, but we can, I can put some flavour in the next uh, report. Thank you. And Councillor Baxter, I think you're next. Uh, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, where can I find your targets for the next three quarters? Uh, we can go, they're, they're listed in the corporate plan that are listed down, but uh, would you want to see them in the um, infographic on the page? I, I'm just curious, uh, Chairman, because it, it follows a very wiggly line in, in each case. Um, and I mean, I, I understand with the qualifications that in quarter one of each year, I guess nobody nobody qualifies in anything in, in, in that particular quarter. Um, but on the external funding, I'm, I'm curious as to how the target is is derived and and where we where we find it. Um, but I can have that conversation offline if you prefer. Okay. In in to. Yep. Yeah, I can we can I can update you offline. No problem at all. Okay. Thank you for that question. And Councillor Griggs, you have an issue to raise. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. It's, it's not an issue, it's more, uh, and I'm, I know we've mentioned it before, and I do apologise, I can't remember. Um, at the bottom of page 32, where we talk about the European funds um, for growth hubs, what's the plan when that funding inevitably disappears, and do we know how long they're going to extend it for? Right, thank you. That's a great question. So we are going to be uh, in a situation where there will be a complete lack of business support provision across Lincolnshire as a whole. So we have been um, a recipient of the European Regional Development Funds to provide business support um, over the last 12 years. And as of June in 2023, that funding will no longer be available. So all of our business advisors and the programmes will come to an end. We have um, been working with local authority colleagues to access some of their shared prosperity funds. <coughs> Uh, but not, we need all of the um, local authorities in Lincolnshire to buy into that offer so that we've got economies of scale and we can afford the advisors and the programmes and the web provision. So currently we are not at a stage where everybody has signed up. Uh, there is a gap um, and we do get a small amount of money from um, the Bayes government departments. Uh, but that is not guaranteed and we don't hear about that until March every year. So. Um, as a result, our business support activity will be tailing off and it will be a much reduced service moving forward. Uh, thank you very much. Just a quick comeback on that. Um, are we feeling the effects of the funding ending yet? Yeah, realistically, those people have jobs, want careers. They're not going to potentially wait around until the funding comes to an end in June to go, oh, there's no more jobs now. Um, I know, obviously, we're trying to put things in place, as you mentioned, but what are the chances of being able to retain the staff long enough to secure funding? Because at the end of the day, yeah, those individuals are going to want some form of job security. Thank yeah. you. No, it's a real struggle. Uh, so uh, we, we also deliver through um, partner organisations. So our startup provider has put all of their staff on notice. Some of them are leaving at Christmas. Um, we have our Business Link advisors that have um, operated through a contractor and they are on a um, retainment um, um, figure in terms of their salary that we, we it's done with the private company, not ourselves. Uh, so they will be remaining until the end of the contract in June, but that's the only um, certainty that we have got that they'll remain until June. That uh, is a really important issue. And <clears throat> I think all members of the committee would be grateful if you could keep us posted on that. Uh, we talked earlier about the value of the role that local government plays working with the private sector in uh, encouraging economic development. Um, 
we're talking about a cliff edge here, and that is something which is deeply disturbing. And I hope you will uh, continue to work very hard with our local government partners to, uh, and indeed to pressure central government to make sure that good work which has been undertaken so far can continue in some form. Councillor Parker. <coughs> My two questions relate to measures that, were not, that didn't meet the target. Looked on page 35. It, it seems from, from what I'm reading here um, that although the, um, the, the target was not met, we had a, a very good explanation for it. Well, that's, that's how it seems, because the hot, dry summer does not produce as much garden waste. This will reduce the overall recycling rate, but this shouldn't be seen as a negative. I'm just interested in how we can get purity into our, <coughs> our targets. Uh, Councillor Parker, forgive me for interrupting, but we haven't quite got to that section yet. Okay. Uh, we're, we, you, I think your question will come in after we've had McReed's report. Thanks. Okay. We'll come back to you. Are there any further questions on Samantha's section? If not, we will move on. And I think next up, Chris, Chris Miller. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, very briefly for me, we have the one measure uh, regarding Section 19 investigations for the Floods and Water Management Act 2010, which committee will be aware is a contextual measure and isn't a target as such. But you'll see from the infographic that we've had a, a leap from um, quarter one up to 58 ongoing investigations, mainly based around the 54 that were started as a result of the mid-August storm event, which you will recall we got plenty of rain in a very short space of time on some very hard ground. Um, and obviously that's meant we've had uh, a significant increase in the number of investigations we've had to uh, undertake, covering, uh, as you can see there, 101 properties of which, uh, or areas of which 79 were residential, 10 commercial, and 12 of which were about streets. And that's my report. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, members, any questions or comments for Chris? I'm looking around the room and I'm not seeing any at all. So in that case, we will simply say thank you and move on to Mick, because we know that we do have a question upcoming for you. <laughs> Mick Reed. Mike, sorry, Chairman. <laughs> <clears throat> you see, I was commenting earlier about not wearing the reading glasses. I do beg your pardon, Mike. No, no problem, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, just So what we're reporting on this morning is, is four performance measures, uh, the first of which is performance indicator 161, which is household waste collected uh, across all streams. Uh, this is showing a, a good trend at the moment because if we can collect fewer waste, less waste, then that is the highest priority on the waste hierarchy. It's, it's better than recycling if we don't have the material presented in the first place. So in the quarter two, in quarter two we are presented with uh, 498 kilograms per household, which is below the target of 560. And interestingly, if, we, if you look at the, uh, the chart on, on the papers, uh, the comparison with last year, it is lower than what we were presented with this time last year, uh, comparing 498 now with 546 last year, which, which is a good, it's a good uh, indicator that uh, we might be doing some good work. However, we, we are at the behest of lots of external factors such as the weather and the economy, so we can't, we're not purely confident that this is all down to good performance. But moving on to the, the second indicator, which is performance indicator 162. This is household waste sent to landfill. Uh, unfortunately, we do have to have this kind of provision in our, in our service. Landfilling is, is the last resort for uh, disposing of our material. However, we have to have this kind of contingency where the energy from waste facility goes offline during emergencies or we have waste which is presented to us, which could be fire damaged or fly tipped, which cannot go through the, the, the normal procedures. So we do have to have a certain allowance for landfill. Fortunately, it, it, fortunately, it is below the target of 5%. It's 4.92 projected for the, the full year, which is, which is good. However, we're always looking to reduce that, and we are in discussions with various companies to to actually improve that, that figure so that we hopefully can, can keep, keep that trend going on a, a downward uh, spiral. 
The third performance indicator is uh, performance indicator 76, which is the household waste recycling centre recycling rate. That is showing a, uh, a current situation of 70.6%, uh, 70 which is below the target of 75%. The annual forecast that we're looking at at the moment is 66%, which is on one of the charts, which I, I hope it's clear for, for members to see. I think this is something that we are not completely uh, in control of. I think we are, we are, it's the material that is presented to, uh, to the different facilities. We've obviously got 11 facilities. We, we don't dictate what the public present to us, but uh, in, in identifying previously economic trends and weather trends which have an, a, an impact on what material, what people uh, produce in terms of waste material, Again, this could be a factor here. We've had a, a very dry summer, as people can appreciate, which has meant that the, the growing season has uh, produced less material, and composting does help to contribute significantly to the recycling rate, and that could have an impact with the, the overall recycling rate at uh, the household waste recycling centres. Uh, still, we, we've been doing some analysis recently, and we're, we're still very confident the, these facilities are an excellent service and they allow us to uh, achieve this recycling rate, which is, if you compare it with the last indicator of, of uh, 43%, which demonstrates the value of household waste recycling centres. Because if we're very conscious that if we provide receptacles and containers for people, people will make the effort to actually recycle. And that's something that we might look to, to increase further uh, at curbside uh, for the public in terms of food waste, if, if people have a food waste container at home, for example, but I just digress slightly. But just coming back to the, the last performance indicator of overall recycling rates, it is, as I just mentioned, 43.8%. It's below the target of 50%. Uh, again, there could be economic factors or uh, the, the weather which is, which is playing into this. Uh, we're, not, we're not fully kind of conscious of where the, uh, where the trends are at the moment, but it's something that we are starting to analyse with, with a bit more, uh, can I say, robustness to look at where, what the, the overall historic trends are and, and what materials have been presented or what the patterns are in, in what materials get presented in the different, different outlets. So it's something that we, I think we're conscious that there are various factors that we're not in control of, but I think uh, where we can uh, can control things. We are still performing extremely well as a county, but obviously there, there, there's always room for improvement. So I'll just open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And my apologies for getting your name slightly wrong. Um, before I turn to Councillor Parker, and we know he has a question, can I just pick up on something you said there? D did you say that material which has been found fly-tipped cannot be sent to the energy from waste? plant and if I got that bit right could you tell us why it's it's the uh, the material which which is contained we're not always sure and co or confident what is contained within that material so because it's not there there is no analysis done or it's, it's from a could be from an extreme source so they, there could be something which is extremely hazardous or contaminated so there's a certain assumption that we have to take that to landfill because otherwise it will be a, a case of having to uh, process that material in a, which, which could create safety issues. So it's, it's purely it's, it's us taking a, a conservative approach to that material. And I'm happy to say that that is becoming less and less uh, fly tipping as an issue, but it's something that we don't like to risk it because we don't know what is in there, where it's come from. Fair enough. Thank you very much indeed for that. Councillor Parker, you were launching into a question and I, I, I delayed you. No, I apologise for that. Um, the, the two areas are the ones where targets were not met. Um, and I suppose that the first question really relates to national standards as opposed to local standards. Um, so I'd be interested in knowing, um, first of all, are there national standards? Um, and if so, how, do we, how well do we do compared to other local authorities? The, the, second, one, the second point in, in, in relation to the, 
the, the first area, the recycling at county council um, owned household waste centres, re relates to what I'm going to call the purity of the, um, the way that we do the assessment. Because it, it seems as though that we um, recycled um, 70.6 um, recycled material. Um, and we mentioned the question um, about green waste in winter. But then we were able to throw in something as an explanation by saying the hot, dry summer, which I suppose is unusual, but let's not make an argument about that, has not produced as much garden waste and this will reduce the overall recycling rate. So in a sense, we've got a built-in um, get-out-of-jail card um, because we haven't got as pure, I, I'm using the word pure, um, method of, of calculation because it's when you've got an excuse of, or an explanation available, then it, it undermines the, um, the quality of the um, actual um, statistic that we're looking at. So I welcome s something on that. Um, and secondly, um, turning over the page to page 36, the performance of 43.8% didn't achieve the target of 50%, and then, th then there's an explanation. But it, but it amounted to, uh, well, we're not sure why. So it, 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 it is about uh, setting targets and trying to meet them, yes. But it's also about putting it, as I said before in the, when, when I spoke earlier, in a national context. And I, I don't know what, what these figures are like, only mm. internally, but not externally. Mike, would you care to pick up those issues? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'll allow my colleague Matthew Mitchell to answer the question one first, but I'll just address the, the second question that was raised, asked in, in terms of household waste recycling centres. Uh, the method of calculation is extremely accurate because we, we know that the material is taken from, which is produced from each site, is, is weighed and has to be accounted for. However, I think the question really is about what are we measuring? Can we influence what we're presented with? And this is where I'm slightly uncomfortable that these are called performance indicators because we are, what the, we are at the behest of what the public present to us. So we are not in control of what the public bring to us. So we could have amazing facilities uh, and if the public decide they don't want to fetch, bring recycling material to the sites, then that will be really poor uh, showing in these performance indicators. We could have very poor performing sites, but if the public decide not to bring residual material uh, and bring lots of recycling material, then we will have incredible recycling figures. So it, it doesn't bear a reflection on what we're doing as a service. We are very much at the behest of what the public present. So if, if in terms of uh, garden waste, if 20% of material coming through a household waste recycling centre is, is compostable and that suddenly drops by 5% because of dry weather, then we can't control that. that that's a figure that we've been asked to, to kind of uh, to re report on. To, we measure that and report on. And I think it's, it's something that we, we have to be comfortable that we can do as much as we can in terms of engagement and communication with the public and also looking at the different recycling outlets that we have from recycling centres. But ultimately, we're, we're in the hands of the public and what the public want to do. And it's, it's their personal choice. And I think we can do a fantastic job, but ultimately we are in that, that kind of strange position where it doesn't show that we are performing well or badly, if I'm being completely honest. Because what we choose as individuals to throw in our separate bins or what we take to a, a recycling centre. That's our personal choice. Um, I think it's a bit naive to think that we can actually over-influence that or have too much power and control on what people, what decisions they take on a daily basis. So it's, it's just adding a kind of a realistic uh, slant on that. Can uh, I quickly come back yes, while you're on that? <coughs> Councillor Parker. I, I've got no argument about that, that's fine. Yeah. But if we've got a national context, then we can actually see how well we do in relation to the local authorities because your argument will apply to every local authority in the country, won't it? it indeed it does. And one thing that I, I think is obvious as, as there's more focus on waste and how we analyse waste is that 
different authorities some, can sometimes measure things in a different way. And I think the DEFRA are looking at, at coming, coming up with a more standardised view on uh, recycling performance and whole waste management performance so that the, the whole country is, is basically playing by the same rules. But if I, I'll just pass on, pass you on to my colleague, Matthew, who can tell us what the, the, the national picture is, if, if you're okay, Matthew. Matthew. Thank you. Um, in terms of the national rate, um, one of the issues with comparing ourselves with other authorities is the national figure is published quite a long way in, in arrears. So the most recent figure I've got is for 2020, uh, when the national rate was 44%. So yes, in terms of that latest figure available, um, we are a bit behind the overall national figure. The problem with measuring ourselves against that is our recycling rate as a county has fallen quite considerably um, over the last three years. Well, I say over the last three years, it fell um, at the beginning of the pandemic and hasn't recovered. Um, we are actually undertaking currently a piece of work through the National Association of Waste Disposal Officers, NORDO, which Mike and I both attend. Um, they have actually at my request, and I requested it as a result of this committee raising it at a previous meeting, um, they are undertaking a piece of work to compile data from um, waste disposal authorities across the country to actually compare and say, has everybody been affected in the same way and are we now in a new normal where recycling rates have fallen, where tonnages being received have fallen, um, like we've seen in Lincolnshire, or what is the national picture? Um, so I'm optimistic that the next time this committee meets, we'll be able to bring some, uh, some better benchmarking data um, through that process. But apologies, we don't really have current figures that we can compare with against at the moment. Matthew, thank you for that. It, it, it is something we discussed at our last meeting, and it's also an issue which uh, was discussed at the Scrutiny Management Board just a few days ago. Uh, and I mentioned to the board then that at our last meeting of this committee, we had asked for that more granular data, and also this issue of trying to benchmark, and I'm very pleased to hear uh, the piece of work that uh, is being undertaken. Um, just going back to something that Mike said about being dependent on, on residents' behaviour, absolutely accept that, but jointly with our Waste Collection Authority colleagues in the Lincolnshire Waste Partnership, um, there is, I think, a role for local government in education and in encouraging people, and I think the importance of that granular data that we talked about is that it could give us the kind of information which will make that easier to do. It's, n it's very easy to say we need to educate residents, but we need to know what are the pinch points, what are the problems, what are the motivations, and for that we need the data as a start point. Uh, uh, Councillor Parker, just coming back to you, does that answer your question? Sorry, can you, can you just remind me, is it the, the question on uh, the performance of 43.8% didn't achieve the target of 50% and then the mention of the twin stream rollout? Yes, uh, yes, sorry, that, that is slightly ambiguous, that uh, explanation, so I apologise for that if that's not clear, but what that is saying is that the twin stream rollout where we are collecting uh, paper and cards separately and uh, half of the county now have a purple lidded bin which is enabling us to have this material going to a different outlet. What it's demonstrating is that where we engage with the public and talk to the people on the streets, uh, we're having uh, increased performance from not just the paper and card that we're receiving, the quality and the lack of contamination, but not just the paper and card, so it's the mixed, re mixed dry recycled material as well that we're also receiving as a consequence. So where we've been in districts uh, prior to the, the twin stream rollout, they, the, the contamination levels were up around kind of high 30% levels with the, the mixed dry recycled material. Where we've engaged with them and been on the streets and, and had our performance team going around and talking to the public, what we've seen uh, is that the consequence of that is that the contamination levels in the mixed dry recycler has dropped, it's approximately halved, and that wasn't the intention of the, the engagement with the public. The engagement with the public was to 
produce a really good quality paper and card, but we've seen the knock-on effect of having a, 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 a good discussion on the streets and basically educating and talking to the public in a more positive, open fashion, that we're seeing indirect benefits that we didn't foresee originally. And, and just coming back to uh, the chairman's point about education, that's something that we see as a real powerful tool and we're, we're now engaging with uh, more schools. We, we produce information packages which have been circulated to primary schools and we've, we've actually got officers going around and presenting uh, waste matters and recycling matters on a more regular basis to educate children because that's the real powerful tool that we can tap into if we can get kids to to kind of go home and promote these these stories and and be more kind of conscious of the environment i think that's something that we we really need to increase and i think it's it's something which could have a huge benefit as well as the the normal uh, issues of, of coming out with uh online information improved websites media outlets uh, i think it's it's a kind of it's a multi-tooled attack to kind of educating the public. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, before I move on, just to say in terms of that street level activity, when paper and card was rolled out uh, recently in North Kesteven, it was great to see county council officers and district council waste collection authority officers out on the streets dealing with residence issues. Uh, and it was very, very well received and very, very successful. Uh, and that's something that I'm sure we can work on as we develop the Lincolnshire Waste Partnership. Right, we have a long list of speakers. Uh, I think Councillor Griggs, you're next. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I know normally I give Mike quite a lot of grief for waste, so I do apologise. But I do agree with everything you said about um, when responding to Councillor Parker. The um, graph at the top of Section 133, so Household Waste Collected, on the face of it, it looks really, really great, and I appreciate you may not have much data behind it, but it'd be interesting comparison point to prior to COVID, because we know more people are still working at home than were prior to COVID, but to see what comparison rate that is. But it generally looks like good performance, so, so well done the team on that. Um, recycling target rate, why, why did we change it when we weren't already achieving, uh, so uh, PI 160, the new national formula. Why did we up the rate from 48% to 50% when we weren't achieving it? I mean, I, I agree we need aspirational targets, but it seems foolish when the rate's not really changed when we're just failing it by more. Um, so that seems like it's an unnecessary criticism of our, our workforce. Um, I also agree that I don't feel these targets are hugely representative of how the waste is performing. Um, for instance, where you talked about the twin stream, surely it would make more sense to have a, this is the recycling rate in the twin stream areas so that we could show the benefit of rolling that out. And I'm sure you'd already have that data. So I just feel that's, I'm not sure whether that's our fault for asking for these particular stats. And is there any other statistics you feel would be um, useful at actually highlighting the performance? For example, um, the waste recycling facilities, seeing how many times they're turning people away I feel would be a better measure than the makeup because as you said whilst we can slightly influence i also agree we can't influence very highly the amount of what materials are arriving at our sites thank you very much mike thank you can i just pass uh, pass you over to matthew again just to talk about the actual uh, the setting of the target because matthew's got more awareness thank you Happy to do that, Mike. Um, yes, in terms of uh, the, the points you raised, the uh, kilograms per household of waste has indeed fallen since pre-COVID. Um, that's overall over the whole system. It's largely because we're seeing less waste through household waste recycling centres, and we're trying to understand that, and that's part of the work that we're, we're on, ongoing with, um, with Nordo looking at national figures to see whether we're seeing the same sorts of things as other places and if it's different, why it might be different, what we might do about it if it is different. Um, but overall, it's good news that, that people seem to be throwing away less waste. Um, in terms of recycling rate, that also, the target we've set for that is also from pre-COVID. Um, you're, you're quite right in terms of it being an aspiration to seek to improve our recycling rate. Um, we did start, start out from where we were at and had what we 
perceived at the time, what the Waste Partnership perceived at the time to be a reasonable progression over the, the following few years. Um, at a recent Waste Partnership meeting, I did raise the possibility with members that we might need to reset targets to start from where we're at and go back to a, a progression from where we're at. Um, members felt that would be a backward step and decided they wanted to retain the aspirational target. And I can certainly see, see both arguments, really. Um, it does mean there is now a bit of a gap between our overall target and where we're at. Um, it is something I'm sure we will revisit, especially if, if we continue to see a similar level to, to where we're at, because improvements of 1% or 2% from where we're at now won't get us to the 50% for a long time. Um, so the Waste Partnership will need to, to keep considering that. Um, I think it's, it's a, a Waste Partnership matter setting or proposing the target um, because of the District Councils being so involved in um, in that recycling rate, in the overall work. Um, but yes, it's something that will be, be revisited in the future, I'm sure. Um, does that cover all of those questions? Good, okay. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I am gonna move on because we still have a, a very full agenda this morning and a number of questions coming up. So next up. Ah, I beg your pardon, I was rushing on too quickly. Mike, did you want to come back on the other part of Councillor Griggs' question? Thank you, Chairman. I, th I thought we got away with that one then, so I'm sorry. Uh, in terms of data nearly for... Did. <laughs> nearly did. Nearly <laughs> did. In terms of data for uh, the different districts where we've rolled out the twin stream, I think, I think that's something that we would be happy to provide uh, outside of this meeting. We can forward it through the Chair uh, and just give, give an idea of, as to what the what the, uh, the improvements have been in the districts. And I think I'd, I'd caveat this in that it's, it, it, it reflects very well for the districts that, that have gone through this process. Uh, but I think that's, that's kind of, I, I don't want to be in a position where we seem to be criticizing the districts that haven't gone through this. So I think it, it demonstrates the value of the whole project where we, we have worked together really well. Uh, but I don't want to, I, I don't want any kind of negativity on the, the districts that haven't gone through this yet because they do, they perform well in, in, in a really difficult uh, situation in different conditions. So I, I think, yeah, we'd be more than happy to provide, provide that. And in terms of, uh, the, I think it was the final question in, in relation to data from household waste recycling centres. I think it, it's something that, that the sites are very busy and gathering information on how many people are turned away is, is something that is not something that we, we've, we've looked to do in the past because it happens, it, it takes time, and sometimes it could escalate situations and put staffing a, a certain type of risk if they're, if they're kind of recording information. So we've, we've been very reluctant to do that in the past. But I think in terms of moving forward, I think one thing we need to start asking questions of ourselves is that should we be looking at uh, potentially having different systems of, of permits for, for the public? So for example, some authorities I've been reading recently are, are enabling the public to apply for permits to dispose of DIY waste uh, and that, that's producing some real benefits because it's, it's, it's preventing uh, commercial traders from disposing of similar types of material. And it is something that we might want to consider in future. But I, I think we have to look to uh, maintain these services purely for the public and not for unscrupulous businesses who, who might be looking to uh, kind of take advantage of the, the public purse. So I think that's something that I'll be discussing with Council McNally. But I think it's, it's something that we could look to do uh, in, the, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just, just quickly coming back. Yeah, I completely see your point. I mean, I personally think that the um, intelligence from the ground, you know, the guys who work there are going to notice if they're seeing the same white beaten up van constantly coming with a big bucket of stuff every day, probably goes beyond DIY. So just us at a face value, I'm generally against the permitting scheme. I, I, the only other bit I asked was, is there any re um, stats that you feel should be in this report to demonstrate how waste is performing that give a better overall view 
than the ones that you have no control over. Honest answer, I, I don't think we have any more statistics. We have lots of data, but it's, it's, it's expressing uh, a pattern or, or any kind of trend at the, any point in time. I think we'll have a chat internally about if there is more useful data that we think we could forward through the chair to be, to be shared. I think it, I'm more than happy to be as, as open and as honest as possible with information, but I am very conscious that you as members do get flooded with lots of information. But I, th I think we'll have a chat and we'll have a chat with the chair about what information. And I'll just provide the invitation if, if, if any members think that they would like to see something that we haven't seen or we're not producing, then by all means express it through, through the chair and we'll try and try and pass things through outside of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and moving on, it is Councillor Hayes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I use the Sleaford uh, recycling site, and there's been several occasions that I've gone there with my car full of the usual bits and pieces, and some of the bins have been full for various materials. So, of course, you're directed to the landfill uh, general waste one. I just wonder how much of a regular issue that is, and presumably other sites suffer with the same uh, problems. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it, is, it is a good point. I, th I think it's something that we became very conscious of about six months ago when uh, there seemed to be a, a real driver shortage. And I'll, I'll, me I'll make the connection, I'll make this point and then I'll demonstrate what the connection is. Six months ago, there was uh, identified a, a driver so shortage in, in haulage. Uh, the consequence for ourselves is that we have to have the sites serviced, i.e. that the containers need to be picked up, taken away for disposal. We've got a very good contractor called Biffa, who I'm sure you're all probably aware of, who had a, uh, a dwindling number of staff that they could call on to operate uh, and service our sites, which meant that we, we went through quite a bit of disruption some months ago, where uh, I think the ultimate sanction was that we had to actually close a site because we couldn't get the bins emptied. However, we came up with some mitigation and came up with extra vehicles and extra drivers through Biffa and through another provider as well to help to service these sites. However, we do sometimes face situations where there might be an issue on the ground, uh, such as a, a vehicle breaking down or just, just trips taking longer than, than we envisage. And I think they're quite minimal now. I think we, we do keep a, a daily log of disruption. And I think it shows that we haven't had any significant disruption for quite some weeks. However, I, I, do, I do accept your point that occasionally we do have a situation like this. But I think it is it's quite rare. Uh, but ultimately, we have to accept the material that people present. And there's always a balance to be struck. Because if, if someone's taken the time to actually load their the vehicle, come to a site. Uh, it's, it, it's a bit of a judgment call sometimes. Do you turn people away if a vehicle, if, a, if the container's full and we can't, we can't for some reason accept that material? Or do we accept that we could divert it into another container, which we accept is not perfect, but it's enabling the, the, the resident to use the service and, and hopefully through explanation, discussion with the site staff, they will appreciate why we're doing things like that so it's not an ideal situation i accept that but we we're restricted by the size of the sites that we've got uh, and if we had sites which were yeah, several times larger with a lot more spare containers then that may never arise however it is it is a situation where we have to cut our cloth accordingly and uh, unfortunately we don't have huge sites everywhere but uh, we have to get the, the maximum uh, efficiency for our Lincolnshire's uh, taxpayers' money. So it's, it's, it's something which there is a balance to be struck. Thank you. Councillor Hayes, are you happy with that answer? Do you need to come back? Uh, only this chairman is that I'm curious what sort of sway it has on the recycling figures. And I know that that's an impossible question to ask, that if it's something that happens relatively frequently 
it must have quite a quite a knock-on effect on 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 the figures that we're we're presented with. Thank you. Be because it is so rare, and because the, the the volumes that we're talking about are, are kind of minuscule in the in the grand scheme of things, I think we, you could be looking at one container maybe weighing uh, several tons in the grand scheme of a. 180,000 tonnes of material being collected, it, it doesn't really sway sway the actual recycling performance. If it did, if we did have a, a record of more issues like this occurring, then we would look to address that in a, a more robust fashion and, and possibly introduce, try and introduce more vehicles, which would have a cost. But I think at, at this point in time, it is quite negligible, the overall effect that has on, uh, on recycling performance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hagues. Next, I think, is Councillor Bowles. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> a number of my questions have already been answered, so I will be brief. Um, it's just going back again to the um, recycling rates at the uh, centres. Um, it says we're at 70.6. I'm just curious to know if that's a consistent level across all sites, or if we do, or if we did have individual sites that fell significantly lower than the others, do we um, offer local interventions to try and understand what the issues are there and how they can be resolved if it's not mirroring what's happening across the rest of the county? Um, and then just again, Chair, I'm sorry to keep going on about this, but I don't know how to address this. I just feel that we're not getting the detail of information in these um, performance reports that we need to, to be able to scrutinise them properly. Um, it's not just a waste, I've raised it earlier, I've raised it last month. I'm constantly asking for more detail, at, you know, the more granular level about the sites, about the areas. I don't feel I'm able to properly scrutinise the figures that I'm being given because I need to have a better understanding about individual areas across the county. So I, I can only imagine that other scrutiny committees are maybe saying the same things, I don't know. I know we've got the, the chairman of the overview scrutiny committee here. Um, if that's coming out in other committees, how can we as a council change that? I know Councillor Fleetwood will, uh, will be aware of it. Uh, our district council, they've gone through a process of re, um, redesigning how they do their, um, these kind of reports and involve members in that about what they would like to see. Um, so whether there's a similar process that could take place here, uh, I just don't know where to take that though. Thank you. Justin, I think you wanted to come in on this one. Yeah, Chairman, thank you. Um, I've, since Councillor Bowles made the comments 10 minutes or so ago on the other part of the report, I've been in correspondence with the Head of Performance and fed his comments back in. And I think myself and Nicole Hilton, as, as, as the lead officers for this committee, will pick up with the Head of Performance and ensure that she hears the message and that we work on trying to address some of the points Councillor Bowles raises. So. Hopefully we can get a bit of movement there. Thank you. I think that would be helpful. There is a difference, of course, between data and information. And what we're interested in as a scrutiny committee is information that can lead to action rather than just being swamped in data. But unless you have the data, it's sometimes very difficult to work out what is, what is actionable and what isn't. Um, I think we'll pick you up on that, and I think we can have offline conversations, and please include uh, Councillor Parker and Councillor Bowles in that, and any other member, uh, where we talk about this. I mean, there is a balance between submerging yourself in data and not having uh, uh, <clears throat> the right amount of, of actionable information. So let's see if we can make some progress on that. Is that satisfactory to you, Councillor Bowles? Excellent. Who do we have next? Councillor Baxter. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Chairman, and thank you for the report. Um, to start on a, on a positive note, I've, I've complained about the information in here for, for several meetings, and I like this new format. It, the, the, the way the data is presented is, is better than it was. Great. Um, we used to hit, uh, 10 years ago, we used to hit the 50% recycling target regularly, frequently, every time. Uh, it's my belief, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the reason it changed, the reason why the recycling um, target fell off or recycling rate fell off is because we withdrew recycling credits uh, which saved the county council a lot of money uh, but it also meant that we recycled less because there is now little financial incentive for district councils to recycle more 
So, so the incentive used to be for the district council to put stuff in the, in our case, a silver bin rather than the black bin. That financial incentive for the district is now gone. Uh, please, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, in terms of the data that we've got, I think it would be useful to see a split by district. Um, I think that would lead to some healthy competition. I, I would like to tease uh, people in other districts about their low recycling rate compared to the South Stephen high recycling rate or the other way around. I'd be happy to be teased by people who think that our recycling rate is not high enough. Uh, so healthy competition is, is one reason. But the other is to, to dig deeper and to see whether or not the, the paper and card uh, collections in three of the seven di districts has actually turbocharged the recycling in those areas. It should have, we're told that it has made a big difference to the contamination uh, and it's made a difference to the amount recycled. I'd like to see the data on that. Um, I would look, at, we also want to see a split by material. So I'd like to know whether or not the, the separation of paper and card has led to an increase, a significant increase in paper and card. I would look for this data um, at the Lincolnshire Waste Partnership. I ca I'm not allowed to ask questions at the Lincolnshire Waste Partnership, but currently that's not a bother because the Lincolnshire Waste Partnership hasn't met since July and the 8th of December meeting is cancelled. Why has that meeting been cancelled? And finally, new burdens. We're expecting that the Environment Act will uh, create new burdens of recycling rates and, and obligations. Are we getting sufficient money from the government for that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before turning to Mike, I think we are in general agreement about the need for additional data, uh, and that's uh, your, your question taps into a theme of the morning, uh, and uh, uh, obviously of our last meeting. Uh, Mike, do you want to pick up those points, please? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, in terms of recycling credits, I think we, we do work very closely with the districts. I think they're looking at their services continually to create efficiencies, and I know East Lindsay have uh, recently changed their collection regimes and how many bring banks they have because that is a service that they have to finance. Now, they're not the most efficient ways of collecting material and that's why the districts have taken that decision not to have these small outlets and it's, it's something which is, it helps us to promote the recycling centres. So, in, in saying that there isn't the incentive for districts, I, I don't believe is true because I think individuals... Uh, have lots of opportunities to present material at curbside with whichever bins they have because districts can be quite different but also the household waste recycling centres are still not uh, fully utilised I think they're, st they're still below the, the, the pre-COVID uh, pre levels at around about 80% usage so there's still plenty of opportunities for people to recycle so I, I don't think uh, paying the districts uh, I, I, I think recycling credits was always a bit of a, a confusing issue, but I don't think giving, giving the district money to do something theoretical for waste, I, I, I don't think that was really ever really a, a, pr a proper process that we wanted to go down. We will pay for the services that are actually being utilised by the districts, and some of the choices made by the districts are made by the districts without any, any kind of influence from ourselves. So... It's something that we are continually discussing with members of the partnerships. Agreed, we will provide more data and uh, happy to provide more material data. I, I can't really, I don't wish to comment on the LWP being cancelled. That was a decision taken by the chair at the time. I, I don't believe, believe it's something that uh, I should be commenting on. But in terms of new burdens funding, we are waiting, still waiting, to see what the, the income will be provided for all authorities. Uh, there seems to be lots of information regarding, or different levels of information depending on who you speak to, but I think we are waiting for funding uh, information to be re released round about Christmas time. They haven't said which Christmas, but I think it, it, it just, it's, it's leaving us to some extent in limbo as to when we find out how we can move forward with other recycling streams, such as food waste. And I think the extended producer responsibility, which will essentially be a, a packaging tax, there's more information coming out soon about that and 
the income that all all sorts of local authorities will be receiving to, to deal with uh, packaging materials and how that taxation is, is levied on, on the private sector. So there's information, a lot of information still outstanding, but the longer that we go on, I think that the more pressure there is on DEFRA to release this information. But I, I don't know if Matthew wants to add anything about that last point or recycling credits. Matthew? Um, nothing huge. I mean, I would reiterate what Mike just said, that we've been promised by DEFRA that the results of their consultations on uh, consistent collections, which includes food waste collections and um, the extended producer response, well, we've had extended producer responsibility, initial response, but we're waiting further information, a deposit return scheme, which they'd also proposed. They consulted... Uh, early last year and we're still waiting on the results of those consultations clearly they've had other things going on other things on their mind other things they've had to work on um, they have said recently that they do still intend to publish all that information by the end of this year um, and i think that fed partly into the the chair's decision in terms of the waste partnership that because we're waiting on some key information that we may then have that information to take into the next waste partnership meeting. Um, but uh, yes, that's, that's the situation on a lot of the things that we're trying to move forwards with at the moment. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think we have <clears throat> something coming in from Councillor McNally, who is on Teams, I believe. Yes, th th thank you, Chairman. Just as, um, just as the Chairman of the LWP, I just, it, it was cancelled, like Matthew said, we, we are waiting for more information from the Environment Act and it is imminent. Um, it just seemed more, more relevant to hold the meeting in, in uh, next month, January, when we get more information on that. And on the other point of Councillor Bactris, if he has got any questions, he doesn't have to wait for an LWP meeting. He doesn't have to wait for a scrutiny meeting. He doesn't have to wait for a full council meeting. He can email me or ring me or any officer any time he likes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor McNally. I am going to move us on because uh, we're, the, this is a, a, particularly the Environment Act, is a, a gift that we'll probably keep on giving and not just in regard to waste. Um, whether it's a gift that we particularly want to receive, I'm not certain. Um, Councillor Spratt, you're on our list. Well, I was going to ask a question, but you've sort of put me off now. But I do want to make one point. In fact, part of the part of the answer to the question you gave earlier on, uh, as indeed did Mike, but do you, not, do you not think that whenever there's a campaign for recycling or vaccination or anything, sometimes, every so often, the message gets stale and you have to refresh the message? And so when the Environment Act becomes a reality and we know what's what, maybe we need to have, to use the word I think you used earlier on, a a uh, public education campaign, or to paraphrase what you said earlier on, Chairman, in order to encourage more people to do more uh, on recycling. In other words, as I say, to refresh the message, boost it up again. And I, I think like most things, when you do that, you'll find that there's an increase in recycling. And let me tell you something else. A year or so after you do that, you'll need to do it again, because I think that's the nature of it, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Spratt, uh, you're talking to somebody who spent a lot of his career in international advertising, so you're preaching to the converted. But we have Councillor McNally coming back, and we'll see if he agrees with us. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Just to say that, 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 that we do do uh, campaigns every now and then called Waste Wednesdays, where we highlight certain issues of, of, of recycling and also where the paper and card rollout has been, we've been constantly feeding the what can go in your recycling what 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 happens to your black bin bag waste and it's a it's a constant feed it's it, you know it's not really it's not all the time but it is constant thank you thank you very much councillor mcnally um yes uh, uh, we have uh covered a great deal on that uh, mike do you want to come back with a final point just a quick question uh councillor spratt excellent point i think i think as officers, we, I think, 
this sounds negative, we don't take our eye off the ball, but because we've got the day job, I think we sometimes forget that we need to be a bit more proactive and, and promote what we do and, and engage with the public, not just in the same way that we've always done, but in more creative ways. And I think we do need to refresh that. And it, we are working very closely with the comms team at the minute as to how we change the message and how we express it uh, to different audiences. And sometimes we need to be a bit more focused to different groups. I think it's something that we'll, we'll always accept that we need to improve and just change how we do things rather than just get into a pattern of every six months we'll do this and then 12 months later we'll do this because I think it does get stale. So completely agree. Thank you. Yes, well, we have, uh, <clears throat> obviously we work in partnership with uh, district level authorities as the waste collection authorities on that. Um, and I'm sure through, we had Councillor McNally on the line, I'm sure through the waste uh, partnership, Lincolnshire Waste Partnership, uh, we can develop some uh, means of, of, of refreshing that education campaign, uh, which will also involve the districts and work through the districts. Um, that effectiveness, I think, is enormously important. And when we spoke at our last meeting about getting more granular data, it was precisely to inform that kind of argument and enable us to, to perhaps change uh, consumer behaviour. Um, but we were looking for that additional information. I'm not seeing any further hands raised, uh, and we have a lot of items on the agenda still to come. We do have a formal proposal in front of us, which is this. Uh, <clears throat> I move that the committee endorses the report and is satisfied with the performance achieved to date and the assurances provided were where targets were not achieve, achieved. And I ask that our comments from today's discussion are passed on to the relevant executive councillor, uh, who is, of course, listening, for consideration uh, as recorded. Um, does anyone dissent from that? I'm seeing no dissent. In that case, that is agreed. Uh, colleagues, we are um, one hour and 40 minutes into our meeting, and we have uh, some very substantial issues coming up. It is now 11.42. Uh, I'm going to adjourn the meeting for five minutes, and we will come back at 2 plus 5, 11.47. Meeting is adjourned.
Welcome back. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the meeting uh, now resumes. We are at item eight on your agenda, economic infrastructure portfolio letting strategy. And this report can be found on pages 37 to 60 of the agenda and enables the committee to review and comment on updates to the council's lettings strategy. Uh, the action before us is, the committee is invited to consider and comment on the contents of the report and to make observations on the principles identified and described in this paper that will support the work of officers and the relevant executive member. And the report will be presented by Simon White. Right, I'm getting names really wrong this morning. I do apologize, Simon. Simon Wright is now right. Regeneration and Portfolio Manager, and Kelly obridge tasker Portfolio Team Leader, Economic Infrastructure. Over to you, Simon and Kelly. Thank you very much uh, this morning, uh, Councillor Carrington, for that introduction. Um, as you rightly said, this is a, uh, an update of our existing letting po uh, lettings strategy. Uh, it isn't a new document. It's one that's been in existence for a number of years now. Um, but it has been um, heavily updated. It's very much an evolution of the, the previous iteration. And we have provided a bit more detail on some of the more technical points contained within the strategy. Um, what the, the purpose of the document really is um, to support a number of audiences, uh, not least of which is the elected members, to uh, tell them about what the work that uh, goes on behind the team consists of. But uh, it also provides a useful uh, document for our tenants, both existing and uh, prospective tenants, so that they can understand some of the nuances of the the legislation and the guidance that, uh, that dictates our day-to-day -day work. And not least, it also acts as a very useful procedure manual for every member of the team to ensure consistency in approach and decision-making, which is incredibly important. I, I think the reason why that is particularly important is that um, the, the reason why the County Council holds the, its portfolio of managed workspace, which is comprises industrial units and uh, offices, uh, is twofold. Um, the first reason for holding that and managing that portfolio is to support the wider economy of Lincolnshire by providing high quality, supported business space for new businesses. Um, but we also balance that really important objective with the need to optimise rental income. And um, those two uh, objectives can some times coming to conflict and they are quite challenging. So by capturing some guidance and some base points in the um, strategy document, we do hope it will um, inform members and officers to, to take a consistent approach to those uh, thorny problems that we, that we regularly face. We've tried to write the document in as plain as English as, uh, way that, as we possibly could. We have tried to avoid jargon where we can and we hope it's uh, a clear and simple document. Um, just, I would like to tease out one or two points contained in the document, but I don't intend to go through all the details um, that's laid out uh, be before you today. But I did want to very briefly touch on our market rents and our approach to, to rental levels, and I just wanted to reassure the committee that we do strive to obtain market rents on all our properties. Not only is that good housekeeping in terms of the county councils, um, revenue and, and budgetary uh, matters, but it's also underpinned by the Local Government uh, uh, Act 1972, which says we have to get best consideration, uh, for whether we're selling a, a freehold sale or, or uh, negotiating a new letting. And we obviously um, do all of our work very much aware of the requirements of that particular piece of legislation. I also wanted to just summarise some of the detail in the document by saying uh, that um, there are a number of uh, very common themes which emerge in our day-to-day -day work, which do provide, uh, which do prove to be the most contentious and time-consuming for us to deal with. And in all of those events, all those occasions, our approach to dealing with those uh, matters reflects not only what is sort of common market practice, but it takes into account um, statutes, I've already mentioned Local Government Act, but also there's a raft of case law precedent that we follow, as well as the professional guidance of uh, bodies such as 
uh, the Royal Institute and of uh, Charter Surveyors in, in particular. So in conclusion, um, we do hope that implementing the strategy will allow the County Council to manage its portfolio um, in, a, in a positive way to balance those twin track objectives of supporting the economy and optimising rental income. Um, we would very much welcome the support of the uh, committee today um, to uh, its views on whether or not the strategy is appropriate and it does indeed meet those objectives. In particular, we're seeking comments on whether or not the strategy is considered to be fair and reasonable, um, that we, it will indeed allow a consistent approach to decision making, and by including some, um, some, some milestones and targets for the team, um, that it will future-proof and prove a robust uh, and effective document. Um, thank you very much, Councillor Carrington. I'm happy to take any questions that the committee might have. Thank you very much, Simon. So, members, do we have any questions? Councillor Bowles. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I, I, I like the strategy. I think it's, it uh, says all the things it should do, and I do agree that we should have a standard um, approach and tact across the board. Um, that said, um, I just want to go to point 21, and how are we performing against current guidelines? Um, and particularly Mercury House in Gainsborough, um, it states it's 30% empty at present. Um, so my first question is, is that, is that now or is, has that been continual for a, a period of time? My local knowledge, just based on hearsay and talking to people, is that it's probably been around that level, if not higher, for a considerable amount of time. Um, so what, within this strategy, could we do to improve that significantly and get that obviously to anywhere near capacity? Thank you. Simon. Um, thank you for that question, Councillor Bowles. Um, just first of all, can I just um, preempt my response or caveat my response? This document is deliberately not a marketing or an agency document to guide how we promote our vacant space. We do have a raft of documents um, back in the office that we, we use to, to, to govern our, our agency work, if I can call it that. Um, but to come specifically to your point about Mercury House, um, I think you're right, Councillor Bowles, it has historically been slightly higher void rates there, so it is better than it has been in the past, um, but there is still room for improve, improvement. Um, I think... Um, there's a number of reasons for that, I think. Um, and it's, it's been a, um, for me, it's been a very interesting comparison to compare the Mercury House site in Gainsborough with what is a very similar size and age building in Market Deeping, which has a very different uh, performance profile. Um, where, and, and I think a lot of that is down to geography and the, the, the relationship that each centre has with its surrounding econ economy in the market town. Um, I think market deeping sits very comfortably to support the Peterborough market and um, uh, uh, but I don't think Gaines this is my own personal view I don't think Gainsborough Mercury House um, has a Peterborough which it can draw from uh, and I, so I think that there is wider competition um, in other locations which has just slightly diluted the offering Gainsborough compared with other centres it is something we're looking at. Um, we, we, we are um, driving out a, a new marketing um, Facebook campaign to, uh, to improve things. Um, we do have a very proactive building manager in the centre who does a lot and has a very good relationship with our, with our tenants. So that's uh, something that we hope to improve in the months ahead. Councillor Bells, do you want to come back on that? <clears throat> Excellent. Next is Councillor Griggs. Thank you very much. Uh, just two quick points. One coming off Councillor Bowles' point. Um, if the vacancy rate is that high, does that mean potentially that we're charging too much in rent? And could you foresee that if we lowered rent to a better level that the occupancy rate would increase or not? Because obviously if it wouldn't, there's no point in lowering rent, but if it would, then there is. Um, my second point is a section, forgive me, I've lost it, the marketing strategy, wherever that is, um, we said we advertise on Zoopla. Why, why is it Zoopla we use and not, say, Zoopla and um, Rightmove, for instance, which is the largest? I'm sure it's probably something to do with the fees, but I'll let you explain it to me. Thank you, Councillor Griggs. Um, yeah, let me deal with that, that first, uh, um, the, the, 
and sorry, the second point first in terms of why is Oopla not right move? Um, we did look very closely and you've answered the question. It was really down to, to the fees there. And to be honest, I did a very quick, very unscientific test myself and put in a couple of search um, questions in the bar. And for every time that uh, right move came first on the, the search results, Zoopla did on another occasion. So my own very unscientific interpretation is that in terms of the internet search hit rate, there's not much in it. But Zoopla was considerably cheaper than Rightmove, and that's something that we, we wanted to trial it, and we, we have just stuck with it. Um, in terms of your first point about rents, um, as I say, it's very difficult for us to do too much on rents, because as I say, we cannot avoid the uh, best consideration uh, legislation. Um, and I think um, we have done a comparison of our rents. We are there or thereabouts with the local market. Obviously, bearing in mind that uh, uh, all uh, managed centres, we offer, uh, we offer inclusive rents, which include um, electricity. Uh, and we do offer a very good service, a very good value service, because of our managed um, front reception where we provide a lot of back office support to our businesses. So obviously our rents reflect that. And um, as I say, I don't think we're massively out of kilter with the uh, remainder of the market. Looking around the room for any further comments from members. Councillor Parker. Yeah. <coughs> what I'm interested in is um, just knowing a bit more about once this um, strategy document has been implemented, how, how it's scrutinised, in the sense that the, the conclusion says a number of things, and it gets to, it says towards the end, a simple analysis of a portfolio indicates that these principles are being effectively applied, and by refreshing the letting strategy, we'll continue to ensure consistent decision-making in the future. Norm, we are a scrutiny committee, of course, and I, I just wonder um, how often and what criteria are used to measure, um, to, to properly do scrutiny? Thank you, Councillor. Um, I think if I can answer that question by advising you that we are coming back to committee in the new year um, with another detailed paper which specifically details the performance of the strategy in terms of the, the void rates, the number of businesses supported. So uh, I would like to take the opportunity in that paper to give you much more detail about the performance of the portfolio for you to scrutinise some of the, obviously the, 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 the questions that you may have. Um, so this, this paper was very much about supporting the decision-making process um, when negotiating rents and selecting tenants, um, there will be an opportunity uh, very early next year to present you with a lot more information about how we're actually performing and uh, welcome any uh, scrutiny from you at, at that time, if, I'm, if I may. Councillor Parker, does that answer your question? It just occurs to me that there is also the opportunity of the work programme uh, where we could, you know, we always say at the end of every meeting, here is the work programme, do members have any suggestions? It could well be that uh, its members wish that this is something which we look at on an annual basis or whatever we think is reasonable, uh, which would hopefully address your question. Would that be a good way forward, Councillor Parker? It would, but I was just interested in when um, th this piece of work um, or the existence of our um, holdings, business, building holdings was last scrutinised. Um, you're testing my memory there, Councillor. I certainly, I, I think it's, it was probably prior to, it was probably just before COVID, I would um, hazard a guess if I was to raid my memory banks. But uh, certainly this strategy document was last updated um, mid-pandemic. Um, then we had the second wave, as it were. Um, so, yeah, but before it had any degree of scrutiny, I'd say it, post, uh, it predates the pandemic. Yeah, so it's a good idea that we had a look, isn't it? Very much, and I think uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make that a reasonably regular issue. Uh, Councillor Griggs would like to come back. Um, yeah, it's pertaining to the report that will come back after the new year. Could I ask that within that report we get an um, inquiry slash conversion rate and, and find out what um, you do, if anything, to people who inquire, you know, when it's a serious inquiry, and then don't take up a letting with us? Thank you very much. 
be very happy to provide that analysis. Thank you. Yeah, I wonder if I could just uh, <clears throat> raise a, a couple of points myself. You said in your introduction that you know we have this twin track objective of supporting the economy and maximising rental income. I would personally add a third to that, which is that it develops the asset base of the county council, uh, which gives us uh, the big greater our asset base, the greater our financial flexibility in, in, in tough times, because local government is permanently and always in tough times. But I wonder if I could ask you really about um, competition. Um, Clearly, uh, I'm assuming, and perhaps you could comment on this, uh, we are attempting to go where the market is not adequate in terms of its provision, particularly to smaller companies, to encourage economic growth. Uh, if so, how do we uh, ensure that we, we, we complement the market rather than compete with it? I'm also uh, conscious of the fact that other entities within local government um, are involved in similar things. Do we take any steps to ensure, again, that we complement the activities of local government partners rather than compete with them? Thank you, Councillor Carrington. Um, in the short answer, uh, yes, um, we do that. It, it's um, obviously quite a complex um, set of circumstances that we would need to uh, evaluate and consider on, on a case-by-case -case basis. I've already talked about the, the huge difference in the market in my experience between Market Deeping and Gainsborough. And so our approach does, um, does reflect that. Um, obviously, we are managing um, an historic portfolio, one that's been built and created over a number of years. And you know, time does not stand still. Um, it is a dynamic portfolio. And it, it is one that we do continually review. Um, we, we, and to give you a couple of examples of that, you know, we, we had a property at Auburn, just outside Lincoln, um, which we um, recently um, decided to make the decision to sell that property. We had some interest from, from the private sector developer. Our tenants wanted to leave. Um, so looking at all of the, um, the, the facts of, of that particular case, the property was declared surplus and uh, sold to a developer. Um, Again, if I can take another example of what we're doing in Whole Beach, South Lincolnshire Food Enterprise Zone, and the creation of the, the, the hub building. And um, clearly that has um, been built to fill a void in the market and to provide the startup space that currently the private sector will not do. Um, Lincolnshire has a number of challenges in terms of construction. There are some very successful developers, don't get me wrong, but generally speaking, our build construction costs are as high as anywhere else, um, but our rental levels, and not just at the county council, I mean across the board, um, aren't as high as they are in the southeast of England. So that makes um, viability for a number of developers quite challenging in Lincolnshire. But where a developer will step in, we will certainly not compete with them. We will do as much as we can to facilitate and encourage and support them. But if there isn't that opportunity, um, if a funding package and the viability can be proven, we will try and put a business case there to provide that support. Thank you very much indeed for that. I'm looking around the room. I'm not seeing any further hands raised. Um, the action point before us is as follows. I move that the committee endorse the report and request that our comments from today's discussion are taken under consideration. Does anyone dissent? I'm seeing no dissent and therefore that matter is agreed. Thank you very much indeed, Simon, for your contribution. We move on to item number nine on the agenda, which is as follows. Update and review of planning services, pre-application advice service. This report can be found on pages 61 to 72 of the agenda and provides the committee with an update and overview of the planning services pre-application advice service since its introduction in May 2021. And the actions before us today are as follows. The committee is invited to consider, discuss and debate one, the information and data presented regarding the uptake and performance of the pre-application advice service since its introduction, two, the increase in the hourly charge out rate, and three, that the head of planning will annually review or update the charging schedule and or terms of the pre-application planning advice service. This report will be presented by Neil McBride, head of planning. Neil, over to you. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, good afternoon, councillors. Hopefully this will be a relatively uh, short um, report for you. Um, the, the information is, is set out in the report. 
in terms of um, the decision of the um, committee back in 2020 was to support the introduction of a, a fee regime for charging for pre-application advice. And at that time, the committee requested that once the charging rate was introduced, um, that a report be brought back to the committee to set out what um, how successful um, it has been and also whether there was any opportunities to look at other um, areas that hadn't been included in that original charging regime that could now be added to that. So that's effectively what the report does. It sets out that since the um, charging regime was introduced in May 2021, um, the amount of income that has been generated, the types of applications that have generated the income, um, the numbers of number of inquiries that uh, we have um, dealt with, and also the recommendation is that uh, we now add to that charging regime advice that we give um, in relation to listed buildings. Um, previously, that wasn't included, uh, but as you'll see in the report, there is quite a lot of um, time spent by officers on inquiries for listed buildings at a pre-application stage. And so that's the opportunity that uh, that uh, element is now included in the charging regime going forward. So um, I set out in the report that the charging regime is based on an hourly rate of officers of £90 per hour. That's been benchmarked against other authorities in close proximity. So we've looked at Norfolk and Nottinghamshire as two neighbouring authorities and looking at uh, uh, the rates that they've charged and we've then um, benchmarked what we propose now to uh, to charge against uh, what those authorities do. So we have also looked at uh, uh, other authorities across the country and our current rate at £55 per hour is the lowest of any authority in the country. So I think at this time it's, it's right that uh, we look to increase the charging rate to pick up um, additional costs that um, we now incur and to make sure that we are in line with other authorities um, around the country. So based on that, the charging regime for the pre-application advice has increased for the different uh, um, types of applications that we deal with and that's set out in the appendix. And I think it's also worth uh, noting that um, in recent times, we also use this charge out rate for work that we do under planning performance agreements. Previously, we've had very few planning performance agreements, but within the last year, due to the increase of nationally significant infrastructure projects that have come um, across the county, and we're heading towards 15 or 16 of those projects, we have the ability to enter into a planning performance agreement with the developers to recover the charges or the costs of providing information to those developers. So again, um, that um, mm -hmm. um, is, a, is another reason why we feel that it's the right time to uh, increase the, the charging um, rates that we currently use. So um, Chairman set out what the actions are from the report. If it is agreed, we would be looking at implementing these charges from the 1st of January 2023. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Um, now then, Councillor Fleetwood, I think you're first in the queue. Thank you, Chairman. Fully support the charges and I'd like to move the recommendations. Well thought out report. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Griffiths. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I definitely don't disagree with charges. The only concern I have is the uh, elasticity of demand for the listed building applications. Um, do we have any data on <coughs> how other authorities, how much they charge, whether the demand changed after the implemented charging. Um, realistically, I personally would have no problem if the fees for significant um, developments was slightly higher to subsidise the cost of providing it to um, listed building applications. Because what we don't want is people not coming and getting advice, messing something up, and potentially getting individuals whose, it may be their home or... Um, you know, a, an asset for the community or, or whatever, getting themselves into bother because they were trying to avoid a £540 fee. 
if you could give me any information you may have on that. Yeah, because of the, I suppose, unique nature of the, the list of building applications that we deal at the county council, we only deal with applications for list of building consents on county council property. So basically, the charges will be incurred by other services within the county council. We, do, we don't uh, um, get involved with, um, with um, local residents because those applications go to the district council. So it's only those uh, involving county council listed buildings where that charge would apply. Thank you very much um, for the clarification. In that case, I'd like to second Councillor Fleetwood's proposal. So we've had it proposed, we've had it seconded. Um, I'm looking to see whether there are any other speakers. Councillor Parker. Yeah, <clears throat> just very briefly, I'm interested in the third action required, which is about the, um, um, what we might call the um, decision that we're going to take to um, allow the head of planning to annually review and update the charging schedule um, on terms of the pre-application planning advice service, et cetera. It's a bit unusual to delegate increases in um, or to review and update the charging schedule. And I just wondered how that's going to be managed from a county council point of view and the involvement of portfolio holders, for example. And secondly, or it could be back to this committee, but I'm not arguing about the principle of the paper. It's just um, having waited some time before we increase the charges. Um, we are now going to do it annually but how are we going to manage that? That's my question. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Parker. Um, so the, the charging regime went to the executive in March 2021, and um, as part of their um, decision-making on the, um, or, or giving the approval for the charging regime to be put in place, they agreed that uh, the delegation be given to the head of planning to basically to uh, to undertake that review on a on an annual basis. So I suppose that's the authority that um, that we are using to uh, to do that from the decision of the executive in February uh, 2021. And if I can just supplement Councillor Parker's question, uh, presumably if uh, you're going to be uh, uh, updating it annually, um, it would then come back to this committee on an annual basis, or this committee could ask for it to come back on an annual basis. Uh, therefore, scrutiny would be able to scrutinise those charges, because it, am I understanding it correctly, they would not go for approval to full council? Yeah, so the, um, the delegation that's in place at the moment allows um, the head of planning to uh, agree those charges, but certainly if that's the committee's uh, wish that uh, that when we get round to, to reviewing them, that uh, they're brought back to this committee for the committee to scrutinise that, then certainly we, we can do that. I think there would be, uh, that would be the committee's wish. Um, uh, we are not, as I understand it, in a position where we can make a profit or a surplus, to put it in local government terms. Uh, we can only ever cover costs, uh, and it is right that we should do so. It is equally right that we should be able to monitor it. Uh, so I think, uh, yes, if you could take on board the fact that on an annual basis the committee would want to have a look at it, and we can perhaps pencil that into future work programmes to make sure that we keep an eye on the matter. Any other speakers on it? Um, <coughs> we've had it proposed and seconded. <coughs> Excuse me, but we do have a formal proposal. I'm just going to read that uh, into the meeting, which is that I move the committee endorses the report and request that our comments from today's debate as captured are taken under consideration by officers in shaping their contribution to the consultation on behalf of LCC, which will help shape the project design. Does anyone dissent? I am seeing no dissenters. That is then agreed. That is agreed. And we move to item 10. On the agenda, which is the Greater Lincolnshire and Rutland Infrastructure Framework. This item can be found on pages 73 to 102 of the agenda pack. The report sets out a framework to guide future strategic infrastructure investments in Greater Lincolnshire and Rutland and invites members to review and debate the proposed approach in the context of achieving sustainable and inclusive growth for the area. <clears throat> the actions before us are as follows. The committee is invited, one, to agree the approach including strategic infrastructure themes and objectives, and two, suggest amendments, enhancements, or additions to the approach taken to date in the context of the current levelling up agenda. 
The report will be presented by Vanessa Strange, Head of Infrastructure Investment. Vanessa, you've been waiting very patiently. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, I should say, actually, we're going to do a bit of a double act on this, if, uh, if you will indul indulge us in that. Um, this committee regularly takes papers on large and significant infrastructure, which is proposed in, uh, for the county. Uh, these take several forms, uh, from the proposals for energy generation uh, that we've just touched on, or to water storage and supply at our previous meeting. Over recent years, we've worked to understand better our need for infrastructure across Lincolnshire, and indeed uh, at a greater Lincolnshire and, and Rutland scale. Uh, the drivers to do this, of course, are multiple, but not least um, uh, set within the context of county deal discussions feel particularly important. Uh, I would describe this work as continually evolving, and as such, we bring a paper to this committee uh, every 12 months or so to describe that the work that we're undertaking um, and to take uh, advice and direction from members. Uh, Mandy Ram, our funding and investment manager, is going to talk to the committee today uh, about the paper in front of you, which describes uh, the work that we've been doing over the last 12 months or so in terms of developing that strategic infrastructure picture. So I'll hand over to Mandy. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this report was written ahead of the Chancellor's statement in November, so thankfully it does stand in the context of the gov government's confirmation that investing in high-quality infrastructure is crucial for harnessing economic growth and productivity, and in that sense, um, supporting for, uh, support for levelling up. Um, the main focus of the report is how we can best identify and develop the case for strategic infrastructure investment in uh, Greater Lincolnshire and Rutland and to support that levelling up within the area to enable residents to effectively access better paid, better skilled employment opportunities, better health outcomes and better quality of life. And it helps us to support levelling up with the rest of the country so that where we may have a, a rural or a coastal or other challenges to growth, that we can overcome them with a, a holistic approach to infrastructure provision. Um, building on the work of previous years, the adoption of a framework approach in 2023 um, rather than a detailed plan, presents an opportunity for partners to reflect both local and strategic needs so that we can uh, represent their distinctive local places. This is all pulled together in one place as a framework and in a hopefully digestible format. Um, in terms of um, why we've changed it, um, we analysed the CIDIP, which was the uh, Strategic in Infrastructure Delivery Plan, um, in 21 and it showed gaps. We've engaged with all of our partners and stakeholders and the premise of that particular plan was a call for projects. Um, it was a good response um, and there was a very effective process for scoring and prioritising those projects. However, it took a long time um, to go through a full business plan uh, case making um, and we found that uh, a lot of the feedback that was capacity was a barrier to participation. And those gaps emerged because there wasn't a particular sponsor or one authority or a sponsor was able to respond better than another. Um, in effect, um, there's no new funding on the table at this point in time for a lot of what we're proposing. Um, and to request partners and sponsors to put forward um, full business cases in a speculative manner, it was felt that that wasn't the best way to do this, hence the framework. So what does the framework do that a plan doesn't? Um, it's leaving us flexibility and a much longer term um, approach. It's built around eight, eight infrastructure themes, seven uh, priority economic sectors and three cost cutting themes around skills, inclusive growth, um, social infrastructure and net zero. These are set out in table two of the report. Um, in terms of the actual framework itself, it comprises a series of documents. So we've got um, an entry point slide deck that isn't shared with the report, was that's still in production. And that will be for all parties to use for key messaging on the needs and the opportunity for the area. A more in-depth set of objectives and deliverables and key principles, that's uh, set out in Appendix A. Um, that's an, uh, um, a, a relatively advanced draft, but we continue to consult with our partners on that. A list of possible projects, um, those that remain from 2021 that's pertinent to what we want to achieve as a collective, and a set of targeted commissioned action plans, which is new to this approach. These will be built around key infrastructure needs. 
these action plans can be responsive to need and predictive of opportunity. Um, CIDIP um, 23, I'll emphasise the F for the framework, has been crafted to complement uh, the LEPS plan for growth, Vision 2050, local plans of partners and levelling up uh, investment, and the County Council's LTP, uh, Local Transport 5. Importantly, though, this is not an LCCM document. We're one of many partners, but we did facilitate it, um, and we've tried to drive it into uh, something that, that we feel is deliverable. It's commissioned by the Greater Lincolnshire Infrastructure Group, and that represents 11 local authorities, including ourselves, the NHS, the Environment Agency, the LEP, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of what this report's inviting you to comment on, um, on is the framework approach, its um, flexibility and its agility, um, and its longer term horizon scanning uh, to support the county's uh, collective growth ambitions. Um, have we represented Lincolnshire, uh, Lincolnshire's unique distinctive places in its economy effectively? Um, and if the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, does the framework sufficiently amplify the case for investment to allow Greater Lincolnshire Rutland to grow its contribution to UK uh, PLC um, and support inclusive growth and net zero transition? And finally, if the three suggested action plans around water management and flooding, energy and waste and circular economy present the best opportunity to get ahead of the game for Lincolnshire by gathering more intelligence to drive future-proofed infrastructure in the county. So that's all I would like to draw your attention to and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much indeed for that uh, very thorough overview. Members, do we have any questions for our colleagues? Councillor Parker. It's a pretty good report. I mean, it covers a lot of things, many important things. It ranges across employment, locations, health. Um, the, the, the thing that's, uh, that I suppose is um, asking perhaps more than this paper is capable of delivering is, is about outcomes. Because it's, it is a, a process-driven approach, which I'm, there's nothing wrong in that. Um, but but it, I can't help but feel that we can better understand the processes if we are given some um, assistance in knowing what the outcomes are going to be. In other words, uh, the so what factor. Um, so the, it's the end of the journey, or at least the stages of the journey, um, to show distinct improvements as a result of this, uh, I call it a, a master plan. Um, but I wondered if you could give us any help in relation to um, where will we be in 2025 or 27 or what time period are we looking to and um, if, if we look at all of the um, the, the case studies um, so what any, any thoughts about what you can tell us I, I think it's a very valid point um, and I think it's a little bit of a, um, a, a sorry Mandy could, could you move the microphone a bit closer they, they're, they're quite faint they don't pick up well so I, th I think it's a very valid point, and I think um, uh, it's a little bit of a work in progress. Um, as we move into the action plans, um, I think we'll get into um, a level of detail which each, each of the thematic um, responses will deliver. Um, you say, what, so what? What does good look like? Um, how do we compare to other areas, etc.? cetera? Um, I don't want it to particularly be a framework that's just a, a measuring device. Um, I don't think partners want that. It's more about action. But I do think we need to measure that performance in some way and see the direction of travel we're trying to achieve with this. So I think um, perhaps it's something that will emerge when we've got to the action plan stage. Please come back, Councillor Parker, if you wish to. If that's the case, then we don't know what other methods of delivering um, a good outcome other than the ones that are before us are. So c can you think, can you tell us anything about competing ideas? You know, when there's a lot of people covering a lot of um, government departments and local authority areas, they're in a room, they don't always see eye to eye, and, and papers like this come as come about as a result of a lot of discussion where competing ideas have been considered and, and, and discarded. Um, and, and that would help us to know how this rose to the, that this completed document rose to the top of the pile, as it were, compared to other initiatives. That's a, a, a very good question. I'm just trying to uh, form an answer in my head here, Councillor Parker, but I'll do my best. Um, 
I would reflect that in uh, discussions around things like county deal where we meet with government departments to not have a document like this to hand uh, and not wanting to um, uh, stray too far from the question, but to not have the document in our hand puts us in a really weak position because we don't understand uh, what we're striving towards. But I, I uh, would agree that we could have gone about that in a different way. I suppose that's a part of the question. Um, we've worked over a number of years to get to this stage with partners and this approach it has been the one that we've uh, we've tried to do in partnership. That's not always easy because we do have um, a, a different lens, I suppose, we're all looking through. Um, and probably that uh, would be true of the document we produced last year where Mandy described some of the gaps that we had within the more project-led um, piece of work. So we took an active decision to step away from that this year and instead to look at those themes um, yes, I'm not sure I'm entirely answering your question, Councillor Parker, and I admit that. Um, perhaps it's something I could pick up with you outside of this meeting and we could discuss further. Would that be acceptable to you? Thank you very much for that. Vanessa, Councillor Baxter. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, it's obviously a huge, a huge paper and a huge topic, um, and I sometimes find these things kind of um, quite Im impenetrable. Um, who, who represents me on this, on this, uh, you called it a glugger, I think, the, the Greater Lincolnshire Investment Group, is that what it was called? Infra the Greater Lincolnshire Infrastructure Group. Um, who, who represents the ordinary resident of Market Deeping or Gainsborough or whoever on this group? Uh, where does it meet? When does it meet? Um, does it have a budget of its own or is everything delivered by individual partners? Uh, and I understand that, that when we meet the government, we need to have some kind of plan in place. Uh, but it, it, it's interesting con to compare and contrast this paper with the one about Team Lincolnshire earlier on. Uh, the, the, there will inevitably be some overlap, but how do we, what action are we taking to prevent uh, duplication of, of work? Um, and also SDIF, SIDF, I think is the Sustainable in Infrastructure Development Framework, uh, but I can't find that listed on the report. It might be that I've missed the, the explanation of the acronym, but, but that, if, if, it's a, if it's a fund, how much is in the fund? If it's a framework, um, I, I, I get it. Um, I, th I think that's, that's all. As for what we're being asked for in terms of suggesting amendments, enhancements, or additions to the approach, I, I, I don't think I'm qualified. Thank you. Vanessa, Mandy, who would like to come back on that? Um, in, um, in terms of the um, CIDF, it's a strategic infrastructure delivery framework. Um, so, as I say, there's no actual funding attached to that. It's to position us ready to take advantage of um, opportunities to, to kind of finance some of the bigger investments. Um, in terms of duplication, um, we've worked extensively um, with our partners externally and internally. So people like uh, Karen Seal and Samantha Harrison have been engaged uh, to make sure that everything we're doing um, complements um, and doesn't duplicate. Um, also, if we view the framework as um, an opportunity to work um, to best value and to, to added value, um, as I said earlier, it actually builds on a series of um, documents that have been consulted upon and engaged with um, the members of the public and residents. So, for instance, local plans, as an example, um, the LTP went out to um, public consultation. This kind of puts it all into a basket and uh, tries to uh, make it cohesive and articulate a case. Um, in terms of um, that, I guess that's where the residents are, are involved in those um, plans on which it draws its headlines from. The infrastructure it's, uh, group itself, that's um, officer-led um, and has people um, you know, from all of the different authorities, as I've said, it has the NHS, it has the Environment Agency and so, so forth. So it does represent that kind of uh, business-led approach and, and, and needs to what we need to put in infrastructure terms um, into the area. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I understand how it's put together. Um, I, 
I don't know. It, it hasn't got its own, but you're telling me it hasn't got its own budget. Uh, and in terms of accountability, if, if, if there is something in here that, that offends somebody in Lincolnshire, how I guess it's held accountable by you bringing it here and me representing that view to say, oh, it's all wrong, or, or, or even applauding it and saying it's all right. Um, I think the, the point of bringing it to, to scrutiny is to gather views and knowledge of this uh, of the area. Um, I don't think we'd f find anything offensive in there because, as I say, it's drawing from other pop uh, public documents and consultations and things like that. It is a framework. Um, it just uh, states a series of things that we would like to happen, that we know needs to happen to grow the economy um, for the benefit of residents. It's um, something from an infrastructure perspective that delivers levelling up both within the county and the county to the rest of the UK. So I think that there's um, lo lots of um, broad parameters within it. I appreciate that. But then when we get to the action plan stages, I think there'll be a lot of a, uh, more of a deeper dive um, with um, various parties and partners and experts to make sure that we get the right actions out of those action plans and they're prioritised and we make sure that we've got um, uh, things that we can deliver, um, et cetera, et cetera. This is all in a broader context of uh, devolution and all of this ask will support our needs and asks of devolution as well. Thank you very much, Mandy. Councillor Griggs. Thank you very much. Um, I find myself agreeing lots with what Councillor Baxter said. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> action's required. I think action one, we can all agree that it's fantastic and there's some really um, amazing stuff in this document. But in, in terms of amendments, enhancements and additions, I feel until we know where we are with particular projects at the moment, their commercial viability, how many partners are interested, and lots more information that I will assume will come through the action plans, I feel we can't really do any of that because I could sit here and go, yeah, we want this in Boston, or but yeah, it's completely unbacked by any facts, figures, data, or anything else. So it's more nothing more than a flippant suggestion. Um, obviously, I will support the report, and I think it's fantastic. But I'm really looking forward to the action plan where we can actually see where stuff is uh, and what sort of scale it might be delivered on and when. Uh, thank you for that. I don't see any other uh, colleagues wishing to speak. I do. Councillor Parker. Very briefly. I, I do think that there ought to be a third action, which is about how we keep a, our, um, a watching brief over this, or the executive keeps a watching brief, or somebody does. Um, because, yes, I don't think we would want to see every single um, good idea as part of this coming back to us, but we want to, we, I could, can't help but feel we want to take a strategic view. Um, I don't know, um, every six months, for example, but it doesn't have to be that. I'm, I'm just thinking about um, how we can continue to scruti exercise our scrutiny role. Well, I wonder if I could put that question to officers. Um, you talked at a number of occasions about when we move to the action plan stage, and that seems to me probably the most fruitful time. Are we best looking at this in terms of stages in the evolution of the project, or are we best looking at this in terms of saying, well, we will look at it again in one year's time and put it on the work programme? How about we say, um, we'll come back to you uh, at the action plan stage, and uh, if we haven't been back within 12 months' time, we will come back anyway. I don't quite know. I'll leave Chiara to do the writing up of that action, but that sounds like a um, the best approach to me because we do tend to come back uh, on an annual basis to talk about this topic to you. Uh, we should have said that we um, will take the final copy to um, chief execs and leaders meetings as well to have visibility at that level just to give members some reassurance um, that uh, the executive have awareness of this work too. Is that satisfactory to members? I'm looking around the room, I think it is. I think this does really underline the enormous complexity of driving infrastructure projects and the need to work with a wide range of partners. And that can be very, very, very difficult to do. It can be very difficult and challenging just to work out a methodology of going forward. Um, I'm very conscious of the amount of work that has gone into this. Um, we're now moving to the stage where I think we say, well done on what's done so far. We're now looking to see outcomes, which are gonna be challenging and the great F question, funding, hangs over all of that. Uh, but we would like to see this come back on the basis that we've discussed. Um, but I don't see any uh, further speakers. So we do have a formal proposal, um, which is that, make sure I'm looking at the right one. 
I move that the committee supports the approach detailed in this report with improvements alterations based on comments from today's discussion that we agree to be passed on to lead officers in support of their efforts in identifying ways forward toward achieving our strategic objectives and priorities. I don't think anybody could disagree with that carefully worded statement. So, does anyone dissent? I'm seeing no dissent. I'm seeing Councillor Baxter. Does anybody else dissent? I abstain. I abstain. I beg your pardon, Councillor Baxter. One abstention, no other dissents in that case. That matter is agreed, and thank you for your contribution, and thank you very much for a very comprehensive report. We move now to item 11 on the agenda, the committee work program. This item is on pages 103 to 108 of the agenda pack, and this item enables the committee to comment on the content of our work program. And it will be presented by Chiara. Over to you. Oh, our actions are to review the work program and highlight any additional scrutiny activity. And we've mentioned a couple of items this morning already, which could be included for consideration in the work program going forward. Chiara. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As you correctly ended, identified, the work program owner uh, is this committee and its members, and we review this work program at each meeting to make sure that the contents are still relevant and that we are achieving um, best value to the work, to complement the work of the council. Um, if I take your gaze to the next meeting, we are anticipating in January to take the revenue and capital budget proposals for 2023-2024, which is a pre-decision item, with an executive decision to be made in February 2023, and following which it will go to Council for a decision again in February 2023. We also anticipate a report on Household Waste Recycling Centre operational contract procurement and the decision for that uh, lays with the Executive Councillor and will be to 2020, uh, apologies, 23rd to 27th of January 2023. We're also anticipating a business premises portfolio disposal strategy uh, to come in as a scrutiny committee report and the planning reform and levelling of bill report that has been previously deferred. I would like to make members aware that the item uh, previously identified as item four, energy options analysis for Greater Lincolnshire interim report has now been rolled to February's meeting due to the fact that officers will not have sufficient time to engage with materials um, they're anticipating in order to put together this report and bring it to this scrutiny committee. As you can still see, the list of items to be programmed is a long one, and it's, uh, it can be found on pages 106 and 107. We're still working together with officers um, and executive members to um, redefine the priorities on this list and to make sure that each and every single item, when the time is appropriate, uh, is slotted in one of our future meetings. As you will see, most of the meetings that have been identified until November 2023 uh, already have very small agendas with one or two items that are mostly standing items or reoccurring items, as, such as um, annual position reports. So I give you my assurance that these will be populated in due course. Um, the additions made today around the letting strategy uh, update report and a return um, indeed of the infrastructure update uh, within the next 12 plus months will also be added to that list of items to be programmed until a date, a suitable date is identified for them to be slotted in the agendas. This concludes my update to you and members of the committee and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Before I turn to members, can I just uh, go back to an issue that we discussed at the beginning of the meeting, and that is Thettlethorpe. Now, that is not completely under co our control in the sense that we get reports from the working group of which this council is a part, but does not run or, or control. I think I'm right in saying that those come on a quarterly basis, usually. Um, we discussed uh, in a written form, uh, we had a report in our October meeting, mm -hmm. So by my calculations, um, we should have something um, for January. Do you know if we will have something in January or will it be February? And I'm going back, of course, to Councillor Baxter's point raised at the last meeting and again at the beginning of this one. 
for the time being, uh, it's actually six monthly reports uh, updates that we receive, and the next one is slotted, is scheduled for the 11th of April 2023, unless there's any interim information, um, any important information um, in the meantime, on which occasion we'll be happy to either bring it earlier or um, circulate any additional information as a briefing statement. And I see Justin indicating. Justin. From what I understand of the working group, I think we ought to be able to bring you something meaningful in February. I was going to say, if they, if they don't have that, um, I think it'd be useful to have at least a verbal update uh, as, a, as a basis for uh, 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 conversation about what work the working group has been doing, even if it's not in a formal sense. I do think it's important that this committee, uh, and indeed those who look at this committee, uh, are kept fully up to up to speed. But uh, February would 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 certainly be good if it's a substantive one. Do you want to come back on that, Justin? Just to say, the working group now produces a newsletter. And I'd be very happy to ask Nuclear Waste Services to put each member of this committee onto the newsletter's mailing list. And quick reminder as well that Nuclear Waste Services are not the only potential investor looking at that site. So I think when we bring something back, it will be about the site and our dialogue with National Grid, of which NWS is one player. That would be excellent. Thank you very much for that. Uh, members, Councillor Baxter. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for, for bringing up that point. I think uh, people in Mablethorpe and people across the county elect their, dis their county councillors uh, in order to have an input into this kind of decision. So I, I would welcome an opportunity at some stage, whether it's February or April, to, to allow members to discuss the issue. We don't necessarily have to agree on it, but uh, the least that our residents uh, expect is an opportunity for their local member to say, to express an opinion on, on their behalf or, or on their own behalf. Similarly with uh, solar solar farms, even though it's a NSIP, NISP uh, issue, I think our residents expect us to, to, to comment at some point. The bit that's missing on this work plan, I think, is the Im Impact of the Environment Act, uh, which we've spoken about earlier in relation to, to waste. Um, that must be something that's heading down the track towards us. Um, forgive me if, I've, if it's on there and I've missed it, uh, but it, it ought, ought to be on there somewhere. Um, the, I, I can comment on that because um, it, it will be. At the moment, we're waiting to see the details of that, and that is the reason for the delay. It's something which we hoped we would know already. Uh, much the same applies to planning reform. Uh, again, that was programmed. Um, it was deferred for the very simple reason that Parliament had not yet decided uh, amid the various changes going on in Westminster what the nature of that reform will be. As soon as we know, we will definitely have it on the agenda for this committee. It is core. Uh, uh, Chairman, planning reform is scheduled for January. Environment Act is not scheduled at all. That's because we just don't know what's going to happen yet, but as soon as we do, it will be it will be scheduled, and it won't have to wait for months and months and months. Do I have any further speakers from the floor? I'm seeing none. In that case, the proposal before us is: I move that we note the report and approve the existing work program as detailed on pages 103 to 108, with the additional items that we have highlighted at various points in our discussion today. Does anyone dissent? I'm seeing no dissenters. Thank you very much indeed. That is agreed. And that brings us um, five minutes ahead of our scheduled time um, to the end of the meeting. Uh, that concludes all our business. I would like to thank all our members uh, for their questions. And I would like to thank the officers, not only for their answers this morning, but for the enormous amount of work that goes into preparing the reports uh, and indeed preparing themselves for scrutiny uh, which goes on behind the scenes and which we don't see. So thank you very much to everybody. That concludes the meeting, and I wish everybody a very safe journey home.